Okay, folks, we are uh, we are live and ready to go. I will call meeting of the council to order. I know we have uh, we're one down because Councillor Heaney indicated that he was that he's out of the country and is not going to be here uh, tonight. I uh, want to review the meeting logistics briefly. Anyone who is joining us remotely, I would appreciate it if you could change your name display to indicate your first and last name so we know who we're talking to and who's talking to us. Um, anyone who addresses the council, again, we would ask you to start by stating your name and where you live. We ask, your, ask you to keep your comments and questions to one, two or three minutes and our communications director will help us with Timing for that, if you are speaking about a specific agenda item, we always ask you to keep your comments germane to uh, to that item. Anyone who wishes to speak must be called on by the mayor. And again, uh, keep your comments to three minutes. And if you speak out of turn, discuss things that are not uh, germane to the topic or go on too long, you may be uh, reminded of the need to adhere to the uh, rules I just stated. Uh, first item is to approve the agenda. Are there any suggestions or changes to the agenda? I have not heard of any. Okay, the agenda is considered approved. Next, we have general business and appearances. This is an opportunity for any member of the public to address the council on any topic that is not on tonight's agenda. And as with other segments of the of the meeting, we ask you to keep your comments to three minutes. Um, looking on uh, online, I see uh, Tori Rodine and Zach Hughes in that order. Tori? Thank you. Um my name's uh, Tori Rodine. I live in Montpelier. Um, I'm very confident at this point, the city council has heard everything that needs to be heard about the circumstances of people being um, displaced from their emergency shelter in the motels. What I want to say is that a couple of weeks ago, I was at a meeting of um, people from faith communities in Montpelier um, talking about how to deal with this emergency. Um, what struck me is that everyone at that meeting said, um, they needed to do something. They needed to do it then. Um, all they have is buildings. The buildings aren't very big. They're not in great shape. They don't have a lot of people. But nevertheless, it was clear that what needed to happen was that people needed shelter. And so the churches would be made available um, until there was a better plan. I want to remind council that the city, um, all of us as a community, own 133 acres of land um, on Country Club Road. Um, I think this is a terrible time to even consider a policy that would make it impossible for people to camp. Right now, people have no place to go, and camping is a terrible option, but um, it is at least a place to go. If the churches can say we have a building, people can come here, then as a city, we can say we have 133 acres, people can come here. Um, and I feel that that is the moral thing to do. Thank you. Thank you. You know, Zach. Yeah. This is Zach Hughes. I'm uh, in District 3, Montpelier. Um, so I'm going to um, try to be fair tonight. And um, I do have some uh, concerns that were brought to my attention by three different reports. But I would like to talk to city staff before I come back here uh, with those um, so I'm going to be fair with those. This comes along with the idea that um, homelessness is not going to go away. We're going to see campers camping. Um, I, I would hope that we continue to follow the encampment policy, which includes a 24-hour notice uh, to the people who are being asked to move along. And that it'd be fair. Um, the other thing is I look forward to working with the Planning Commission that I found out today uh, in its meeting this week discussed some concerns 
along the bike path. I would love to, uh, you know, connect with them and talk to them about some ideas. Um, you know, so you might be hearing from them about stuff. Um, I watched their meeting today on video and I was kind of, I shared their frustrations um, and started trying to come up with some ideas around their concerns. So I, I really um, want to continue to emphasize value and the fact that what do we value here um, and um, that homelessness is not going to go away and we need to continue to work together. I would also Lastly, I'd like to urge that all the municipalities come together to talk about ideas in case the state doesn't come all the way through for us. Thank you very much, Jack. Thanks, Zach. I don't see anybody else online seeking to be recognized. Anybody in the room who'd like to be recognized? Steve. Steve Whitaker. Uh, I want to remind you that in August, you seemed to take the emergency camping issue seriously, and you said, we're going to direct that the Homelessness Task Force and the Housing Task Force come up in a 30-day rush plan and resolve this. You did none of that. Nobody did anything of that. And so you don't have a plan, and the state doesn't have a plan, and I think you should table the policy tonight because I'm not going to be here. You should not that's not why you should table it. You should table it because it's cruel and not and it criminalizes uh or it policyizes, prohibits. Uh, but I want to speak briefly about the city cheating on the growth center application. Fundamentally the city knew it didn't have a master plan adopted that addressed the specific infrastructure, roads, sidewalks, water, sewers, where the buildings are going to go, et cetera. That's what's required in a growth center application. And the application has to be uh, the same, whether it's a new application or an expansion. That's in the law. And so for this city to be cheating the process and pursuing it before we've identified where those buildings and sidewalks and water and sewer and what that road is going to cost, et cetera, and it not only has to be in the mapping, it has to be in a capital budget. And you did none of those things. So you cheated, your staff cheated the Vermont Community Investment Board this week. And it's nothing to be proud of. It's it's a demonstrates a ne ne lack of oversight, a negligence on the part of the council to oversee what the mismanager is doing. I'm reminding you of what happened in June of 23, at your last meeting where you talked about the, uh, you did not adopt the uh, actionable plan. You accepted and you called it an actual plan, not an actionable plan. There were severe reservations about, is it a working draft? It's more like a working draft than anything, a lot of concerns. And you discussed putting it on for a workshop, a whole meeting long workshop in August. And, Obviously, we had a flood, and that got tabled. But meanwhile, your staff is a runaway train, pretending and, and posting all over the website and all over the press that this is a this is our strategy, this is the adopted plan, and it is not. It's a lie. So when are y'all going to step up and hold this staff accountable to what your decisions? You, you are the policymakers. You need to set these decisions about what. So in that report, I'll call you briefly. Recreation Zone Working Group, a working group, not a consultant, an Abenaki Working Group, a Mobility Working Group, and then the Housing Assessment. None of those things have been done. Thanks, Steve. That's your time. Well, when are you all going to hear about this? Thank you. That's a question that deserves an answer because you got you got a real serious problem here. I can answer that question. I uh, I don't have my calendar right in front of me. One of the next two, one of the two meetings in October is scheduled for a full debrief on that project where we're at, what's happening with all those steps. Um, so the the follow up that you so that is when you'll hear about it. It is scheduled. So uh, and we we were prepared to talk about all of those different steps that were referenced. It's all good points. And just to be clear, um, 
appreciate Mr. Whitaker's concerns, and I believe he expressed those to the state board as well. Um, they did accept 13 to 1, the plan, and the state staff had deemed it, you know, okay to go forward, so just so people are aware of that. So our growth center was approved on Monday, and, you know, Mr. Whitaker did express the same thoughts there, and they felt differently, so. Thanks, Bill. Anybody else in the, in the room would like to address the council at this point? Okay. Next up, we have the consent agenda. Yes, Carrie. I'd like to request that um, letter F, the Capital City Corridor Bike Share Scoping Study, be pulled off the consent agenda. Okay. Are you ready to discuss it tonight? Yeah. I just have a question. Okay. Anyone else? Okay. Is there a motion to approve the uh, consent agenda with the exception of item F? Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. Item F. Do you have something you specifically yeah, want to I address? A specific question about it um, that it's asking us to approve a three thousand dollar match towards a grant, and I'm I'm just thinking about the the our budget process and and how we pretty much accounted for every penny everywhere and i'm wondering where in our budget this three thousand dollars is was that something that was planned for in advance is it coming out of somewhere else how are we taking care of that whose item is this i'm sorry i've been away because uh, it should be identified and the source of the fund should be identified in the cover sheet so oh okay it's Maybe not then it. um Corey. Hey, uh, Corey Lyon with Public Works. Um, so typically with this grant program, the funding will be from CIP and we will capital improvement plan identify it after the grant has been awarded, then comes the budget process. So it sort of flows with it. Okay. And so, um, yeah, typically it's CIP. Okay. I'm looking more closely now and I see it says FY26 budget. Yeah. So we're being asked to approve something for our next budget before we've even started our budget process and commit those funds. Is that correct? Right. It was FY 26. Okay. Have, have we done this in other cases? Is this? Yeah. It's, with this grant program, because of the timing okay. of it, oh, okay. this is how it, we would typically do it. Um, You're always budgeting a couple of years ahead. Right. They, they find out, they, they award in August, September. And so October, November, it's kind of how it leads into it. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Anything else? And did I, I can see the skepticism. So just to allay your concerns, I mean, <laughs> our capital plan is, you know, close to a million dollars. So there's usually three, you know, 3,000 is something we can, if that, if it's a, something that you want to do, if it was 30,000, we would probably be handling this differently. So just sure. Okay. Oh, can I just say one more thing? Mm -hmm. I would love to see some more information about this um, at some point in the future about the justification for the study and the. Um, there was some reference in there about um, the e-bike lending program was showing increased demand, and I'd love to see some more specific information about that. It doesn't have to be tonight, but just at some point as this program goes, I would like some more detailed information about the need for this and the rationale and. Um, with some data to back it up. But that that's just a placeholder. I'm not asking for that for right now. It's fine. <laughs> so you don't want to hold it this up tonight? No, 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 no. Don't want to hold it up. Okay. So is there a motion to approve item F? So moved. And is there a second? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. Thank you. We are now up to... We've approved the consent agenda. We're now up to item six, second reading of the responsible employer ordinance. Um, who's got this? Is that you? Well, is that it's Kelly? me with Kurt, oh, Kurt. Um, as you know. And as you know, we uh, brought this to the council. The council said they wanted to discuss it and voted to bring it to uh, ordinance amendment, pass first reading. I did... Uh, Speaking with council, meeting, uh, council member Heaney last week, he did ask if there was any way we could postpone it till the time when he was here, uh, because 
oh, he's interested in it. Uh, but um, obviously he didn't put it in writing to anybody or ask counsel. So I'm just relaying his re verbal mm -hmm. request to me at the end of last week. It's really up to you what you choose to do. Folks, what's your pleasure? This is something that he's been very interested in over the couple of months we've been discussing it. You did, you did copy me on it. I don't. Did others get a copy of it? Oh, I didn't. Note. Yeah, didn't copy me. That's yeah. why I didn't see it. Oh, okay. I I, I don't think it's an unreasonable request. <laughs> Everybody okay with doing that? Should we have a vote? I'm wondering if it will make a difference to the outcome. And there are people here tonight who wanted to speak to this. And so, so what you could do is that you could, so it was warned for a public hearing tonight. So you could still hold the public hearing and then you could set another public hearing for next the next meeting if that's what you chose to do or you could take action on it tonight whatever those are your choices but yeah i mean if people are here to speak on it they ought to be able to speak on it. okay so i'll just be very open that i'm not in favor of waiving this so i'm going to vote no and so i would prefer to have fewer people here who are going to vote yes so there's a better <laughs> chance that it will fail <laughs> so i'm not really in favor of postponing it for another yes vote and <laughs> but the people who want to vote yes probably feel differently. And, and to answer your question, <laughs> it uh, it could make a difference in the outcome of the vote because it takes four votes to pass something. Lauren, I would at least definitely like to hear from the people who have come out. And so maybe do we have to know where we're heading with it? Can we open the public hearing and then see how the conversation goes? Yeah, we that's definitely what, can. That's what you should always do with a public hearing. <laughs> we don't know what's going to happen until we've heard from the public, right? Perfect. Makes yeah. total sense. So I'll open the public hearing. Kurt? Hi, I'm Kurt Modica, Director of Public Works. Um, so as uh, many folks know, we have a, a responsible employer, employer ordinance, which includes state wage rates for city funded projects um, that are in excess of $200,000. And um, originally brought this to council because of, um, you know, the tough economic times that the city is currently in. Um, it does uh, have the potential to impact the amount of paving we can do, the amount of water line replacement work that we can do. Um, not just because of um, uh, the increased rates for workers, but also the administrative uh, overhead. Um, so just a few things that were cut in the last budget. You know, one one that obviously is um, concerning to me is the the staff position for public works. We did reduce um, a streets position. Um, that's uh, caused us not to be able to do as much support for the paving program. Typically, public works adjust the structures, the mantles, the catch basins up and down to support the paving. <clears throat> we weren't able to do that this year with the, with the low staff plus the added workload of the flood. And so that added $150,000 to the um, contract cost. Um, so I just, I uh, guess my question to council is, um, you know, where does this fall within the priorities of a flood recovery? We have a lot of abatements. Um, super tough budget. Last time we pretty much cut everything out of operating. There's not really anything else to go. We've deferred paving for since the pandemic. Um, we're roughly two, a little over $2 million behind in paving that we need to catch up on. And there's a ton of water work to do. So from my perspective, my job is to um, maintain the city's infrastructure. That's kind of one of my primary goals here. And, um, you know, this reduces how much uh, I'm able to move forward. Um, and I'm concerned about how far behind the city is. Um, so that's why I bring it to uh, council and I'll leave it at that. And, and Kurt, one of the questions that <clears throat> that I've been uh, trying to uh, to get a handle on is whether we're at, we're actually paying, whether the contractors that we hire are actually paying already the wages that are uh, required by the ordinance. And I wonder if you have any insight into that question. 
right? So you brought this up at the last hearing, and I did speak with the contractor on School Street about it. They weren't immediately um, interested in providing the pre and post rates for their employees. Um, I think potentially just uh, concerned about, you know, other contractors seeing what they pay and mm -hmm. stealing their staff. So, um, so I don't know for sure. I do expect that there is some change in rates, but I don't know. I don't have any actual data to prove it. Um, we also uh, are just starting the paving contract, which does have these ordinance provisions in place. Uh, they have asked not to do, um, do the sign-in sheet the way the ordinance is written. Um, you know, staff, any employee has to sign in and sign out every day, which is kind of actually cumbersome for the contractors. They've actually requested to provide us certified payroll. So, um, you know, a signed statement of what every employee is actually getting paid. Um, which is the federal process for any Davis-Bacon rate project. That's how it's done. So what we're seeing is this is a very unusual ordinance. It's cumbersome for um, contractors uh, to implement it, and they'd rather do something that they're more familiar with, which is the Davis-Bacon rates with certified payroll. It's easier for them. And for the city, we get um, signed certified documents that we know exactly what they're being paid um, so we can verify that it is a correct rate under the current city ordinance, we don't have any way to verify. They're just signing a statement saying that they'll comply with it and then signing in and out their staff daily. But we don't see the rates. Um, and there's no, you know, uh, real um, audit provisions within the ordinance. Uh, so the other, the one other thing I wanted to mention is um, if this is suspended for to support the city's flood recovery, um, how would it be reenacted? And um, what I would suggest is that uh, staff work with the contractors that have gone through this ordinance, the paving and the school street, um, get feedback from them about you know how it could be done more efficiently. Is certified payroll a better method or the sign-in sheet? And kind of what are the implications on overhead cost to them that's not actually being paid to the employees? And try to, try to uh, make some changes to the ordinance that make it uh, more effective, more accountable, um, and... Um, just more manageable uh, for contractors. So that my suggestion, if if you do decide to vote tonight on an action, uh, and and that action is to temporarily suspend it for two years, which is the current motion on the table, um, that uh, that it's reinstated by a vote with proposed changes um, from from staff. Thanks, Kurt. Of course, those could be two separate things. You know, at, at any time, someone could bring forward. A proposal to amend our ordinances, but but I, I get what you're saying. Right, it would still take two public hearings. <laughs> yep, in either case, so just for efficiency. Suggestion. Thanks, Kurt. Anybody else have any quest other questions for him before he uh, sits down? Okay, Mr. Casey. Thanks very much. How you doing, folks? Uh, Welcome Connor. back. Yeah, no, it's good to be back. Yeah, not much has changed. A few faces, but. Uh, <laughs> So uh, Connor Casey, state representative, uh, former member of the council, uh, and I was on the council when we did pass this ordinance. Uh, he was the one who introduced it, so felt the need to come here today and uh, talk a bit about it. Uh, first of all, I, I come from a labor background, so this is an issue that's close to my heart, and the uh, construction industry is one that you routinely see misclassification and employees abused. So that's why protections are put in place like this. Uh, to prevent that from happening. Um, I currently serve on the Institutions Committee up at the State House, uh, which writes the capital construction bill, uh, where prevailing wage at the state level is put in place. And, uh, you know, like I always thought it was a bit preposterous that you could have a state building being built in the city, the state capital, and a city project right next to it, with employees being treated completely different with a completely different wage. Um, you would have received a uh, email on the 28th from Larry Moquin. He's the uh, president of the AFL-CIO, uh, talking about the move to suspend the ordinance for two years. And uh, Larry gave a few figures there, one being that, you know, right now, a laborer, which is kind of the lower end, you know, on a work site, would be making uh, $20.70 uh, an hour under the prevailing wage at the state level. Uh, whereas if you revert it back to Davis-Bacon, which this ordinance would do for two years, 
uh, that same person would be making $17.20. But it gets worse. The $17.20 is only due to an executive order by President Biden that raised that from $12 and I think 50 cents, uh, which would be below our minimum wage. Uh, if President Biden were to, you know, well, he will lose the election. He's not running again. So if, uh, let's just say, let, let's say President Trump got elected and decided to reverse this executive order, uh, we'd have somebody taking a real and very meaningful reduction in their wages. And for a low-income wage worker, this is devastating. Not only the salary, but the fringe benefits as well there. So um, obviously, I'm opposed to uh, reducing this. As, as Larry Mokwin said, he's very open to changes in the ordinance, uh, open to changes that don't entail sort of the Davis-Bacon uh, reversion there. But you know, as far as the administrative burden, I think there's areas to talk. But it would be irresponsible to do that without talking to the people who did that work. When we passed that ordinance, we had a ton of frontline workers in this crowd coming up, telling their stories. And it really motivated all of us to unanimously pass this ordinance. Tears in their eyes, honestly. They came up here and said, OK, you want us to come in and build your town? We can't afford to live in your town with what you're paying us. So could you do something about that? Um, I think where I fall on it now is my recommendation to you would be there's a dishonesty in suspending this for two years, right? There's never going to be a good time to do this. We're going to have more floods. I don't know if the city budget's going to be in great shape in two years. It's probably not. We get hit with one thing after another. COVID, you know, we have the pandemic. We have the flood. We have another flood to some extent. There's never going to be a good time to do it. But it's always the right time to, like, do the right thing. And, and I, I think, you know, rather than suspending it, uh, as Kurt said, uh, maybe bring people here and see how you could adjust it, see how you could amend it a bit to make it less burdensome to have the bids come in there. I'll remind you, uh, once Montpelier passed this ordinance, uh, Barry followed and then Burlington followed. We really set an example here, and I think we have a responsibility to uphold that. So if you, if you don't amend it and you choose to suspend it, I'd almost rather you repeal it. I'd, I'd rather you take the vote to repeal it if that's what you're going to do. Because it's more honest and it's saying we can't afford to do this for folks, right? And if that's a case, that's a case. But let's look people in the eye and do the right thing in this case. So that's that's where I'm at, folks. But and it's Thank, good to be here. <clears throat> thanks, Connor. Um what is your feel thinking about the current ordinance we have now in comparison to the state statute? Like, would you be okay if we because it sounds like you're saying the state already has a prevailing wage statute for state projects. I'd, I'd say the last thing I would change in this ordinance is changing it from prevailing wage at the state level to Davis-Bacon, because uh, that really hits people in the wallet, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, it's going to cause some real pain to folks. And there's a reason. There's a reason they're not giving up the numbers, right? There's a reason that it's easier to get contractors. They don't want to pay workers as much. That's what it comes down to. So let's say it what it is, right? Okay, thanks. Thanks very much. Uh, side note, you should haul, uh, haul the delegation in on the homelessness issue and haul the administrative uh, uh, executive branch in too. It, it's disgusting what we're saying. You know, I feel ashamed at the state level we have this policy and people, rather than like living in hotels, they're going to be dying off the bike path in the cold and the dark. So you were right to have that press conference, haul us in, hold us accountable. Connor, I think you may have at least one question. Sure, Seth. Yeah, hi, Connor. Um, one, of, one of the things we seem to be experiencing is uh, we're, we're not getting enough bids on these projects. Um, was that something, I don't know when this ordinance was originally passed, but there seems to be a reluctance. I'm not sure whether it's because of the climate that we're in, because there's so much work people don't bother don't need don't need it or whether it's the ordinance itself that's that's uh you know causing them to not not bother to bid for it did did that occur when this ordinance was originally passed or is this yeah i'm not sure i would to get good enough sample size of the bids coming in afterwards but i i will say like there is a shortage of construction workers in the state that's very real and uh you know it has delayed state projects as well. We see that at the state level. But uh, I'd also say you get what you pay for, right? And if you want to reduce liabilities for the city, if you you know, want to treat people right, you know, it's, it's a price you have to pay. 
And like Kurt's saying, I'm sure the administrative burden is very real. And, and if that's the reason they're not bidding, that can be addressed. And I would, I would recommend having the people in here who helped shape this ordinance to work through that and amend it to the point where we can get more bids rather than just push it aside for two years because that doesn't make any sense at all to me. Any other questions before we move to the next speaker? All right. Thanks very Thanks much, folks. Appreciate it. <clears throat> Anybody else in the room who'd like to address this topic? And I do not see anyone online seeking to be recognized. Oh, uh, Lisa. And I apologize. My camera is not able to work tonight. Um, I just wanted to address the issue that Connor is bringing up tonight. Um, certainly, Connor, I wish you had been able to be here last week or, or the last meeting. We had several contractors come for, well, I shouldn't say several. I've so far had two contractors come forward around the work on the flood management stuff where they have said that they are unwilling to work on the projects when these boundaries are in place because the projects are smaller enough that it is cutting out local smaller businesses from the work because they can't handle the overhead of trying to track the different prices for the different types of work for their different employees. And so although I agree with the concept of what is trying to go forward here, for these smaller projects, we have seen this as a direct barrier to those. And so if there's a way to handle that, that would be terrific. But that's where I, I'm showing some resistance to this, is that we have these flood projects that we're having so much trouble getting people to present contracts for, and this has been another barrier for those. Thank you. Thanks, Lisa. Anybody else? I'll just pause for a moment to give anyone who's online a chance to raise your hand if, if you're looking to do that. And Lisa, if you could raise, put lower your hand, that would be good. If I could figure out how, I would. I'm working on it. Oh, it looks like you did it. Great. <clears throat> no, or maybe you didn't. Well, okay. Yeah. Great. Um, I got it. Thank you. Yep. Okay. I'm not seeing any other um, people seeking to address us, so I'll close the public hearing. And... Now we're at a point where we can decide whether we want to take any action. We could do any number of things, including somebody could or could not make a motion to uh, to adopt the uh, proposal or anything else. There is no motion on the table. No, there's no motion on the table. Well, I'll move that we uh, we postpone till um, next meeting and hold an additional hearing. Is there a second? Any discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right. So, Lauren. I'm just wondering if it's possible, you know, so we've heard Burlington and Barry have done this. Um, we've heard an openness to working to address what's like a big part of this seems like the process is problematic for contractors and that is dissuading people. So there's like, there's the cost, which is, you know, you can debate, should we be paying workers more? And like, what can we afford right now? And, you know, I support the ordinance that we have on the books right now. Um, but I'm just wondering, like, is there data? I just feel like there's so little information and data, and it feels very anecdotal, everything that we're hearing. So I don't know if by if we're postponing, you know, like, are Barry and Burlington having these same issues? Do they have a process that's working better for tracking um, is this is this just like a widespread 
um, issue that nobody's getting a lot of bids and it's not actually our ordinance, but we're blaming it. Like, so I just feel like I, we're making a decision based on what feels like very scant data. And like, I un totally understand like Kurt looking to <laughs> get, get as many projects, like I, the, the motivation and the pressure that um, our, all of our departments are under with budgets and like where this is coming from. And I feel like if we're going to, I mean, I'm not going to be supporting postponing it anyway, but, um, but for everyone to be making a decision, it's just like, is there any better data or information that we can get that can compare what other communities are dealing with and just reality check a little bit of what we're hearing? That sounds like a suggestion that maybe we shouldn't take this up at our next meeting, but like two meetings out so that we have time to collect the data. What do you think, Lauren? Yeah, because I mean, I would be happy to try to you know, now that Connor's raised like raised his head again to get some actual like information and suggestions from um, the union folks and others and look at what the um, recommendations from the contractors are and see if it looks like there is a path to propose at least an alternative so we could be picking between two things, um, you know, either the mm -hmm. uh, postponing or a path to make this a simpler uh, and cleaner ordinance to implement. So I'd, I'm happy to try to do some work on that. But yeah, I probably would take more than two weeks. So are, if we're not, so oh, go ahead. is that like a amendment to move the third hearing to well, the next we just, meeting? We just passed it, but we didn't put it, the motion didn't include a date. Okay. It said next week. It said next week. Oh, oh. <laughs> okay. I didn't, I didn't, under, I so didn't, that. I didn't catch that. I thought, okay. Yeah. So do, we'll just get a sense of it. Do people think that like putting it off for two meetings uh, is a way to get some better information? Because it seems to me better information is always better. So uh, could I ask Kurt a question? Are, are you signing contracts daily or? How much of a difference does a one month delay versus a two week delay make? Um, probably the one biggest difference is the um, East State Street contract one is about ready to go out to bid, and we were um, kind of waiting till tonight's meeting to to know if we were going to include the provisions or not. Um, so we would, if it's proposed, if it's um, postponed for two meetings, then we will include it in the ordinance within that bid. So, and that's approximately. You know, on probably about a one and a half million dollar project. It's a storm outfall from the bottom of East State out to the Rialto, the new core through the abutment and everything. So um so there'll be some cost implications for that. That's our biggest one. We don't have a lot of other projects that are about to go out to bid or any that I can think of off the top of my head. And we we don't know what it actually costs us, but we haven't we have an estimate from the current project, the school street project of what? 10%, 12%, 10%. Yeah. Okay, so there we are. Are we happy with uh, where things stand? Or impose on people to do all the work that needs to be done to be back here at the next meeting i mean i think we can certainly get i think we can get information from barry and burlington how it's working and the success and what data they may have uh if any um i don't know but you know whether we can convene discussions with the union all that so i think we can look at other things but um, we can bring at least that kind of information back and can always Let's put it again. Mm -hmm. it's it's yeah. Connor, can we call on you to help us help connect us to the people we want to talk to? Great. Well, it sounds I'm not hearing a motion to uh, reconsider and amend. So as it, as things stand now, we're taking this up again at our next meeting. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Connor. Uh, next up, we have item seven, the second public reading of the parking ordinance. 
and we have uh, the printed uh, version in our hands right now. And I will open our public hearing. Hey, can everybody hear me okay? Yes, I Perfect. can. I should okay. say, I can. <laughs> awesome. Um, Kelly Murphy, Assistant City Manager. Um, just as we're getting into this second public hearing, I just wanted to set the stage. Um, on the screen right now, we've got the draft ordinance. Um, I have made changes um, based on our last public hearing, um, and there have been a few other items suggested, which are highlighted within this document and are at your desks. Um, and if we wanted to suggest additional language, I can edit this um, live. Um, so I just thought that I would note that. Um, so the, the reason for um, amending the parking ordinance is really around the appeals language. Um, and in doing that, there were a couple of other items that were brought up. Um, and so those items are outlined in the cover of the agenda. I can get into those specifically, but I'm just going to get into the changes that I've made since last time. Um, you'll notice that in the um, online version uh, that's on the screen right now, but then also in front of you, there's a couple of different colors in this text. Um, the blue are um, changes that were suggested um, sort of by email by uh, council members and then the yellow um, are the changes that we've made thus far um, and then getting into sort of the items that um, were recommended at the last public hearing um, one uh, was to address the um, parking in front of the post office um, this is taken up in section 10-702b there is no change because we can amend the two-hour parking within the um, meters and I cited that location because of the specific um, location of the post office is already noted within the ordinance. Um, the second thing um, was sightline language allowing for staff to designate no parking zones up to 20 feet from any marked crosswalk or intersection. And this is taken up in section 10-718B and C. Um, and so staff has recommended language on that front um, and if you're following along, uh, that is on page, flipping live here, um, page 16. Um, and so you can see that there is suggested language for each of these items. Um, this takes up crosswalks, but it also takes up intersections. Um, and so I can, you know, speak to that language each of them. Um, so the first one for the crosswalks is the city manager or DPW director may upon determining that it is necessary for safety based on existing traffic conditions and sight lines designate a no parking zone within a distance of 20 feet from any marked crosswalk. And then the next um, identification is with intersections. And so that language reads, the city manager or DPW director may, upon determining that it is necessary for safety based on existing traffic conditions and sight lines, designate no parking within a distance of 50 feet from the curb line of another street. And so those are based on staff recommendations in each of those instances. Um, and so just moving along to the Next item that we did take up at the last hearing um, is around the appeals language and just cleaning up that so that it's a, a little bit um, clearer um, in terms of, you know, reading that through. Um, and so that is in section 10-719. 
Um, and so I'm just going to get into the specifics around um, the appeal process, and I'm just going to read it out loud to make sure that it makes sense. Um, a person may appeal a parking ticket violation within 10 days of the issuance of the ticket using the following process. First, in writing to the Montpelier Police Department Chief of Police, if the appeal to the Chief of Police is denied, the person may choose to submit the appeal in writing within 10 days of the denial to the city manager or designated hearing officer assigned by the city manager for a final decision. At that time, the appellant may elect to have a hearing. A hearing will not be automatically scheduled and will be waived if the appellant does not request such a hearing in writing. If the appeal is denied by the city manager or hearing officer, there is no further appeal and will be certified as such. So that's uh, what we took up at the last hearing. And since then, um, some other suggested areas um, that are, are highlighted in blue um, are sections 10-704, hours of use and rates, 10-707, parallel parking, 10-708, coin deposit and time violation. That one is also a, a clarity in the language item. Um, that's why I've got the uh, language posted here if we wanted to take that up. And then section 10-715C, which is the removal of vehicles. Um, and so we can get into those items if you'd like. And so that's what I've got for comments at this point. Um, so I'll hand it back over. Thanks, Kelly. Folks have any questions? Adrian. Thanks for reading that out loud. That was like really helpful for my processing. So just a quick question. For the 10-719, the parking violation penalty, um, what is a hearing? I mean, maybe there is like a process for a hearing, but like who's in the hearing? Like, what does that even mean? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so the hearing really would be, I think, an opportunity to sit with the hearing officer in person. Um, so whether that's the city manager or the designee to hear sort of the details of the particular issue. I think I'd probably add a sentence in there, just very much describing what a hearing is, like being as explicit as possible. Something along the lines of at such hearing, the person shall be entitled to present uh, evidence to establish that the uh, ticket was issued in error or something like that. Yeah, you might even want to give it an amount of time. Like within 30 minutes, um, I don't know, whatever the amount of time you want, the hearing will be conducted by the appointed person or the hearing officer, whatever the language is, to present the case and a final decision will be made at the end of that. Hearing. It might even be clearer to say the city yeah. manager or their designee. Yeah. And, it's just... and I think you can say like a hearing could be a meeting. It could be virtual in person. I think just as explicit as you can, like there should be no gray area about what a hearing is. Right. And it's then what happens after. of evidence and yeah. attorneys and yep. witnesses and mm -hmm. all of that. And that I think a time frame is also important. You don't want a hearing to go on for like three hours. I mean, I don't think you nope. do. Oh, you're, I think you're right. I think that, um, but we also heard a suggestion that there was a hearing at which a person wasn't allowed to present evidence. And that seems, seems like if, if well, you could show that something was clearly wrong, you should be able to present evidence of that. What were you going to say, Bill? I was going to say that the the person had missed the 10 day window for the hearing on the merits on the ticket. Okay. There's a second hearing about whether or not they should be given the boot, which case is basically their chance to plead their financial situation or ex executing circumstances or those kind of things. It's not about. So yes, they were not allowed to present evidence about the merits of their ticket from years past. Gotcha. Because they had passed that window. Mm -hmm. So, but I do think, sure, we could, I, I like the idea of a time limit and I like just maybe even saying an informal hearing or, yeah. or a meeting, even. Just conduct a meeting with the person. 
I believe the Supreme Court's ruled, right, that the, the court cases, the parking tickets aren't eligible for courts. Is that what I understood? Is that right or no? There's no right to appeal a parking ticket to court, right, or any right. And I, in the statutes that I deal with, I probably have some language that I can get you for. That would be great for a standard, yeah. Any other, Cassel? Uh, I suggested a couple of the uh, blue uh, highlighted items. The one in seven hundred four. None of these were to. You know, change the policy, but just to make, to make it more intelligible. I I didn't quite. I thought I thought the wording in seven hundred four was just a little complicated. I I hoped that what I suggested was simpler. In in seven hundred seven, in seven hundred seven, ten seven hundred seven, uh, where it's talking about a a vehicle you know parked overtime. Um. There, there are a couple of places in that very long paragraph where the where the the language just doesn't make any sense. So I, it it also talks about you know depositing coins and paying with um, electronically and so on. When the, when the point is that you go, when you move, pull into the parking space, you activate the meter. How you activate it is a you know separate issue. It's included. So I just switched it around, and the language that I proposed I don't think is actually in the document it, it's not and that's um on me in terms of being able to see within the pdf what you're suggesting um and so i'm, I'm happy to to modify that and you mean 708 correct yeah the i coin guess it's, it deposit is, yeah, time it by 708 yeah violation I, yeah i missed yeah. the head hurt the bottom of the I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to um adjust we've got another adjustment too and again it was just to make it more intelligible and to it was kind of a sentence fragment in there about how the uh, how you determined whether the car was parked over time that tried to describe what the meter was doing and it was completely unintelligible. Well, you know, that, but anyway. <laughs> so that raises the question that, that I've, sorry, Lauren, I didn't know, didn't see your hand. I wasn't looking at, um, and I'm wondering about how, if someone knows how park mobile works, um, because if I were, if I use Park Mobile and I park at a meter, and I'm there for two hours, if I move my car to another parking meter uh, that's also in the same Park Mobile zone, can I use it to activate a second meter, or will it think, well, you're still parking here, you're trying to extend? Uh, it's a good question. We allowed. can certainly get clarity on that. Um, my assumption, right, maybe the chief may know. Go, go ahead, phone a friend. Line up, chief. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Eric Nordenson from the police department. First of all, thank you for reviewing this ordinance. It has been in desperate need, so I'm thrilled that you're looking at it. Uh, second, the park mobile, you have to go to a different zone. So it, it, can, it considers that one zone, that two hour limit, and you have to go to another zone. That's one of the kind of the limitations we have with park mobile. That goes in your ear. Yeah. Um, so it becomes a little tricky for us. We try and be like pretty reasonable with the issuance of those tickets. Um, but there is a there is a, a challenge with that for sure. Uh -huh. Okay, thanks. We stay here. You, you good. Lauren, you had your hand up, right? Yeah, very minor point, and I guess I'm not totally clear what language. I liked the cleanup. I think Sal was getting at for this same section, but was just going to say if we're being kind of generic about payment, like right now it doesn't say credit card. In the future, we might go back to meters with credit card and wouldn't want to have to change the ordinance, so we might put payment, which may include coins, credit card, or um, okay. online or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one thought just to be inclusive or make it like a may include instead of technology might evolve to something else we're paying with watches or something, who knows? Like, um, so, and then the, one other just very minor thing just noticed um, in language in 10, 724, I don't know if this is the only section just stood out the most where we're just trying to make the language more gender inclusive. Um, we do also have 
non-binary community members. So I'm just wondering if it can be they, them, which if you read it, it reads fine for all of these, the chief of police or their designate there or they shall notify. So I think like in general, we could be moving towards that. Like it just works, it's cleaner anyway, and it's inclusive as we are updating ordinances. Thanks, Lauren. Yeah, I have another question that I'm not, I wanna make sure I'm reading this right and wondering if we're, if we're stumbling into a place we don't wanna stumble. And this is the proposal for 704. Uh, with the exception of 24-hour parking lots and unless otherwise specified by the city council, it shall be unlawful for the operator or owner of a motor vehicle to park in metered zones. Oh, oh, never mind. I uh, I was reading it wrong, so, so I'm good. Any other questions from members of the council? Okay, I will open it. To the public, does any member of the public present or online have uh, any comments or questions? Okay, I will close the public hearing. So it looks like we're coming back for another re meeting. So we a motion for a uh, for a th third. So I yes, I agree with that, and just to use our time wisely. Um, the, the only two real changes that I wrote down was more definition of the appeal and changing the gender neutrality language, right? The other language, the blue was good. So with the exception of 708. 708, right. Yep. Thank you. Yeah, I don't want it. I want to make sure we're moving the ball down the field a little as we, yep. as we yep. go, so. Okay, is there a motion to do that? and schedule a third public hearing. So moved by so moved. Councillor Earl. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Thanks, Kelly. Okay. Um, Country Club Road Use Policy, item number eight. At our last meeting, we discussed this policy and you had some feedback about it. And uh, we tried to make some changes to the policy based on your feedback and to really mirror that of other um, other parks or park-like places. Um, one of the questions that came up was, you know, I think the question about alcohol. And we actually took a look at that and alcohol is permitted in Hubbard Park in certain designated areas. It's not fully permitted all through the park. So mm -hmm. that's what we put in right now. There are no designated areas at Country Club Road, but there could be. Uh, and so it would really match that same provision. Um, and I don't know if there's anything else Kelly wants to flag. Um, here, just going through my checklist here. So we had the um, clarity of motorized vehicle use. So in the parking lots, just to make sure that, you know, we were covering, you know, where vehicles can be used on the property. Um, we uh, did include language to um, allow for use of alcohol based on the Hubbard Park um, policy. So it's, you know, allows for um, permission. Um, and then includes exceptions to camping and overnight stays. Um, so for example, when the winter shelter is um, in operation and also for permitted use. So if there was a recreation group or some other reason why there may be camping on that property. Um, and then we also clarified um, firearm use for, for hunting purposes. Any questions from any members of the council? What's what firearms specifically do we authorize? I mean, there's a general ban on anything, but what shotguns and so they would if you were using a firearm, you would have to have a hunting license mm -hmm. to use that firearm. So we, mm -hmm. it's not specific within the policy, but that would be the intention. Is that you know there, it would be it would come along with a license under anything we allow for hunting any other place in the city. Mm -hmm. Carrie. Um. So I'm curious about the the alcohol use, um, just in you know, just trying to find specific rules about Hubbard Park and 
alcohol use and so Harbor Park areas. says that alcohol where, use. Where is that located? How would a member of the public find that and know about it? For Harbor Park? Yeah. So um, it's, it's either in the ordinance or in their park rules. It's not in the park, the park rules. And it's not in the park rules that are posted on the website. But I do feel like there's more extensive rules somewhere because there's, because there's not very much in these rules that are on the website. I mean, we got that was the information we got from from Alec when we debriefed this yep. after the last meeting. So it was a designated area. So only we found that. So, I mean, it's at the shelters when you have a, you can have a family pick up and have beer, wine, and that thing, but it's not generally permitted throughout the park. That's, I think, again, we have to go back and look. We've been gone. So, or we can, we can hold this too. And that's what we find out. So, so yeah, I mean, we're um, happy to get sort of the specific citation for you if that's what you're looking for. Um, I think that was great. And I think it needs to be on the website, the, the complete rule so that people, because if just, I mean, unless I'm missing something, um, I haven't been able to see that. And so it looks like you can drink alcohol anywhere in Hubbard Park. Um, I think if, if I'm remembering correctly, and I want to look at the citation again and just provide it with, I'm happy to do that. Um, it's just that it, it, it's an exception. So it's like, it's not, um, it's sort of like, except Hover Park, this is, you know, the yes, exactly. So it's not sort of really specifying, you know, the conditions in which you might permit alcohol. It just sort of, I think, leaves it open. And that's my recollection, but I'm happy to take a look. Adrian. Um, I'm just uh, processing this policy and, and thinking kind of as the, as the bigger picture um, in terms of what's been going on with homelessness, the letters we received this week um, via email from the Homelessness Task Force and the press release. And I just, I don't want to have like unintended consequences for, you know, not thinking through this policy, the encampment policy, and taking recommendations from the homelessness task force. And so I don't know if if we could, you know, have some time to think about it, maybe even have like a special meeting focused on the encampment policy, this policy, responding to um, the homelessness task force list of actions that they put forward, and really having some time as a council to think through all these policies and what do we want, how do we want to move forward in unison and how do we support, you know, how do we really support this, this, wor this work that we have to do in, in, in Montpelier? So I feel like all these like policies and ordinances, like I want to take a look at it holistically and make some really strategic um, and supportive decisions together. Yeah, it makes sense to me, um, Carrie. Then Lauren. So I I uh, um I agree in general with what um, Adrian is saying, and that we do need to kind of look at our at, at at this holistically. I do think that the way this policy is written um is not in conflict with our encampment policy, and and so. I feel okay about it the way it's written, although I do want to continue to talk about the alcohol part because I think there's a whole other question about there. But um, but in terms of saying that camping is not allowed, that it says this in this draft policy, that's also in the Hubbard Park rules. Camping is not allowed. And our encampment policy says, okay, yes, it's true, public camping is not allowed. However, and we handle this is how we handle it in various ways, and I and I think our encampment policy gives us a lot of room to um, to allow people to camp or to not if they're you know and address problems. So I feel like this policy we shouldn't put too much emphasis on um, what this policy says in terms of how it affects people's ability or not to camp on the property. That's a different question. And I do think we need to talk about that. And I don't think we need to talk about whether the whole country club road really is a highly sensitive area or whether you know we should be handling individual encampments more strategically and specifically. But I don't think that this policy, um, I, I don't I don't think it comes into play in this policy. So I think so I, I think it's okay to pass this policy that says no camping is allowed. 
And yet it doesn't necessarily mean that people will never be able to camp there. Thanks, Carrie. Lauren. Well, that's really getting the wheels. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I, I also, I mean, yeah, I guess I could be okay with this knowing that the way that we're going to continue enforcing our encampment policy means that when people have nowhere else to go, like just doing this, which feels like it's trying to send a message, don't camp here and also don't camp anywhere and people have nowhere to go right now. And so I just think this like, we do need this bigger conversation. I'm wondering, you know, I think Connor's right. We should haul in our delegation and haul in administration officials and like really try to understand like who is working on what, what are the options? Like what, it's just, just such an egregious abdication of our collective responsibility of like what's happening. So it just feels like passing this in isolation without that bigger conversation is just sending a signal. Like Montpelier city council says, don't camp here provides no clarification on where people should go. So, I mean, I personally would rather like wait and have this vote as a part of a bigger conversation to make clear that we're, that is not what we're trying to say. We're trying to say that this is a policy, but yeah. So I'd like to jump in on this. I know other people want to comment as well, but I want to make sure to, this is on the table for discussion. Um, first of all, we have been following the encampment policy completely. You know, Zach mentioned earlier, we have certainly been providing 24-hour notice, if if not even longer. We've not issued any um, no trespass orders. We've not arrested anybody for camping. I think that's important. We've been following our policy as it's drafted. If you look at the policy that talks about highly sensitive areas, there is a section about environmentally sensitive, but there's also other things that make an area sensitive, including safety and those kinds of things. So, some, so, so we've been trying to make sure we fall within that completely because that is the city's policy. The concern, I guess, I'll, I'll say it, the concern I have, the concern staff has is if we don't say this, if we basically implicitly make this permitted, we have no, we have no boundaries, we have no rails, and we have no means of handling the numbers that, because essentially it becomes a permitted use and you could have 100 people camping there, and that's not an exaggeration. There's over 100 people coming out of hotels now, and we have no means of maintaining sanitation for them or safety or anything else. I see where Burlington, who has a very extensive, and to their credit, they've really, you know, they have the resources. They have opened up, I think it was 12 or 20 campsites to be managed, have to be reserved. They're putting people on it. That's in Burlington, and that's 20 sites. Um, and we don't have the, the wherewithal just, you know, and I will say, you know, Kelly and I just got back today from four days with our fellow professionals around the country. This is an issue everywhere. Everyone's dealing with it. And they're all at about the same place we are um, because they don't have, I mean, the smaller communities, they don't have the resources. And it's not because we don't want people to go somewhere, but we can't, once we say it's okay to be on our property, then we have a responsibility to make it safe and provide the services that people need. And, you know, we're down five police officers and we're down a couple of uh, DPW people and, and, you know, our, our highway folks have been out cleaning up things that I'm sure they never anticipated they'd be cleaning up when they took a job plowing snow and filling potholes and, and those kinds of things. So, um, so, Yes, we have to provide it. And I think, you know, our recommendation is to say this is it gives us the ability to try to handle the situation in a manageable fashion. Yeah, if there's a handful of people and they're not causing a problem and they're keeping the sites clean, we let that go for most of the summer until a whole bunch more people showed up and started causing problems. And then we had to address the problems. And um, some of the folks that stayed the longest were the folks that continued not being problems. And we haven't pushed that. And I think that's been the case in Harvard Park and everything else. So I, I strongly recommend that we keep this in, not because we want to be mean or nasty, but until unless and until we can find the means to help um, provide a, a safe, clean, and sanitary site. And the other thing is, not, you know, it, I'll just leave it. Thanks, Bill. So. Um, I, I guess uh, I, I agree with with, with all, all four of these comments, if that's possible. Um, 
since they seem to conflict a little bit with each other. But I, I think we need the policy now, but I also, uh, I think we really need the a, me a special meeting to discuss the, the larger issues. And I think we ought to, we ought to make it a workshop type meeting. We've talked about that um, in the spring. And this is a perfect opportunity to sit down with, with everybody we can think of you know, to to discuss it as in in as far reaching a way as we possibly can. But I I think it's important to get this policy on the books now. Uh, the encampment policy we have I think has been followed pretty pretty closely, and it it's really walks a very fine line. I think it does it in a uh, in the best way possible under the circumstances. But we need to explore when things happen like the sort of failure of the state program and and disturbances by smaller groups within larger groups of campers we don't have a good way of handling that stuff so i i'm okay with passing it as as written um i'd just like to add and i think having further conversation is certainly a healthy and good idea i'd, I'd like to remind council and the public that Four meetings ago, July 17, we had every provider and partner in this room for a very lengthy presentation about how, what we are doing and how we're doing it and what our policy is and what our partners can and can't provide because we we proactively knew this was coming and we wanted to make sure everyone was on board with how we were handling it. The only thing that's really changed since then is in August, a bigger crowd showed up at country club road and we had to use the policy to manage it and we heard about it and fairly that's that's legit but all the conditions that were in place in july when we had the state's attorney in washington county mental health the good sam and i forget who else was here but it, it was all, all the players so i think we can get some of those folks together again i i think that would be healthy but i also this has been top of our list for the better part of this year lauren yeah, thanks. Thanks for that context, Bill, and and reminder. I think like my hope with this workshop, I like the idea of doing it as a workshop. Is I feel like we've gotten some really good context on the challenges. Like we had a clear heads up what was coming. What we haven't gotten to are really any solutions that the city is, or like more comprehensive solutions. So it's like there's certainly like there's a ton of work that the city staff are doing, but like what else can we be doing? And some of that more brainstorming that we hopefully could do in a workshop format. And I think having the state sitting in the room with us, if we can get them here to be part of that, like to really dig in on what funding sources are available, like what resources staffing otherwise they could provide to help us move forward on solutions. Um, like that's a piece that I think has been missing so far. Um, I don't know if there's like do this in conjunction with Barry or something, try to, I mean, this is a regional problem. Maybe it's a collective conversation, see if they're interested in uh, doing a workshop together. Um, but yeah, like I just, I think it's like moving it to some more hopefully action steps in partnership with the state would be my hope. Adrian. Yeah, I mean, I think what we had a couple of meetings ago was the setup for this. And so now we've had our, you know, our press release, we've had a call to action. We just received, um, you know, a letter from the homelessness task force with a list of recommendations. And so I would love, you know, that opportunity to hear from them, respond to them. I love the idea of a joint um, meeting with Barry because it's not just Montpelier. So what resources do they have? What resources do we have? Bringing in, I mean, um, you know, Connor said, call them to the table. So I think we should, I think we should take them up on that offer. And I love the idea of a workshop, but their work has evolved since we first heard from our partners. And we do have a list of um, recommendations and action steps that I think the council needs to discuss and respond to from the homelessness task force. I see, Palin. I think framing the name of the meeting is important to me. If we, I understand what we mean when we say it workshop, but it should be like action taking something like that. So there should be some kind of action steps after that meeting. 
because we are trying to solve an issue that local governments cannot solve. So this is this is very important. We can talk about days in a workshop. They can be great ideas coming out that meeting. But if the decision making makers do not hear it and do not take any action, then they will be on the paper. So however we want to organize the meeting, we should really think about, okay, there are at least two or three actions will come out this meeting and everybody will do their part. And at least for a specific time, we will support our community. So uh, just a suggestion. Thanks, yeah. Pam. We have a couple of people, members of the public. Uh, uh, Torin, you're up first. Tori, sorry. You're up first. Um, thank you. The um, just a couple of points of history. The um, there there are a couple of partners who were not at the meeting several weeks ago. One is the Montpelier Homelessness Task Force, which is the body that is actually supposed to be supporting and advising um, city council about issues relating to the to unhoused um, people here. Um, the other partners who were not at that meeting were the local churches who were very involved in churches and other faith communities who are very involved around this issue and I think very resourceful in terms of um, providing shelter and providing people and providing other resources. The Homelessness Task Force um, is ready to meet with city council um, and the chief of police and other concerned people at any moment um, at convenient or inconvenient times at reasonable or outrageous times. Um, you just need to let us know when you would like to meet with us. and We would be more than ready to meet with you. Um, our understanding of what happened with the um, small group of folks who were camping, um, I think, pretty quietly up at Country Club Road is that um, in some order, um, a second group of people who were known to um, some people working on the ground were directed up there. Um, they were directed up there um, in part by someone involved in the staff. Um, predictable issues arose. At that point, Country Club Road suddenly became, if, I, if, if my understanding of the history is correct, that's the point at which Country Club Road became, quote, a, a highly sensitive area, unquote. I don't think it was before that. And that's absolutely correct that at that point, um, certain guidelines came into force with regard to camping because it got declared um, a highly sensitive area. And I don't think as a task force that we actually know how that happened, nor nor do we really know how that can be appealed, if it can be appealed. Um, and even at that time, there were people um, working with the un unhoused population um, who knew the people involved, who were ready to meet with um, city staff and others to do um, whatever might be helpful in resolving the conflicts that were occurring. Um, and these are, um, we're, we're here as resources for you. Um, and I'm one of the less knowledgeable of the available resources, but there are other people who are far more knowledgeable um, who um, are, you know, that's, that's why, that's why, that's why we're here. That's, that's why we're showing up here and we really can help in this situation. So please let us help. Thanks, Tori. Uh, Zach. Uh, yes. And, um, I just, uh, Zach is again, uh, District 3's uh, Prospect Street, Montpelier. And um, before I get going, I just wanted to say to y'all, uh, shortening the city council meeting three minutes would be cool, just like civil board of authority. Anyway, I, um, you know, I I would like to think that, that um, you know, that encampment policy would give y'all room. I hope it does. But, you know, I have been receiving intermittent reports that uh, it hasn't been completely followed. That's why I wanted to follow up with staff as soon as possible. And I would be concerned that that would continue uh, to possibly be the case. I do understand we need to pass this. I, I get that. Um, I And I struggle with the ones that, with the folks who are making messes up there in these lands, um, because, you know, after hearing the planning commission uh, the other day, I really became really upset. Um, you know, I, but I, I do wanna say that we do need to figure some things out because this is not gonna end. Camping is not gonna end, regardless of whether you have 
a rule in place or not, people are going to set down where they need to set down. Um, and and um, and I appreciate that no trespass orders have been uh, issued or anything like that. But I also believe there's some traumatic stuff going on with folks. I mean, if they feel their um, tents have been walked through, then that's how they feel in the moment. Um, this is very uh, serious stuff, and it's a hard thing to do. And I'm hoping we can continue together. Thank you. Thanks, Zach. Um, book Carrie. So the uh, homelessness task force sent us a letter requesting the meeting, and we've heard that reiterated from people in the public here. And um, I, I would prefer if we're going to have a meeting to talk about all this again. I would prefer it to be as structured as possible. Mm -hmm. And um, since I think we have heard a lot and talked a lot, and we don't, we don't know what to do, but we have this homelessness task force that we have charged with trying to give us advice and guidance and they have said we just heard right now they've, they've told us we're here to help use our help so uh i think we should take them up on that right away and uh tell them what we need and try to you know take it from there rather than i don't want to just have another open discussion where we just i mean we can do that too but i'm just not sure it's going to get us anywhere but the homelessness task force is saying to us that they need more guidance from us they want to meet with us. They want to hear from us, and they want to us. I guess they want to tell us stuff too. So, if we could schedule that meeting for as soon as possible, not another, not two weeks from now, the next city council meeting, but just maybe just a, a separate meeting, I think that would be great. So, how about a meeting with them and state officials, and then if, if then perhaps with Barry after that, rather than to try to make it too big at once, talk to our own folks, get our our local people here. And uh, they have written us a, uh, some recommendations so we can be prepared to comment on those and, and what our sense is. I think that probably makes sense. Um, when do you want to do it? Oh. This is yeah. this is not about <laughs> scheduling, um, but I just I know we've also heard um, from Chief Nordenson and we've also heard that DPW, like I'd also love if part of the conversation, if there's like specific tools that would help make sure, like it feels like there's challenges with, you know, do our policies allow enforcement of like problematic behaviors as opposed to just people who don't have anywhere to go and are trying to camp. So like if there's specific ideas of things we can be doing to like give the tools or if it's like talking to the state's attorney or whatever, like it, it might be that there's limited things that we can do. But like part of the conversation too is like what's what gives us the right set of uh, yeah, I guess I can't think of a better word, but like ways that we can be both like supporting people and making sure that if there's problematic behavior, we can deal with it. So that doesn't then ruin things for everybody else. <laughs> so I not to sound like a broken record or skipping CD or whatever they are today. Um, the, the, really, everybody in the state is dealing with the same issues. And that letter that we wrote jointly with a bunch of other communities really did lay out the tools and things that we need. We, we municipal governments feel like we need from the state or from someone. And that included, um, you know, accountability measures from the courts, state's attorneys, and even some of the statutes that were passed that um, made things a little looser that really aren't helpful. I, you know, I, I, it pains me when I hear people or people say, you know, the police aren't doing anything when they're citing people and the folks are out the next day. So it looks like they're not doing anything, but you know, the citations are there and they're all getting dismissed or not, you know, not even charges or anything. We, we charge them and then the state's attorney drops the charges and the, or it goes to court and they get dismissed. So that certainly creates a disincentive for police officers and also for the community seeing that. So yes, I think there are a number of external supports that we need. And to the point of, I think, Palin saying, you know, what are the actions that the city can actually take? Because I think that, you know, it's important to understand the needs of these folks and also understand, I mean, was it $350,000 a year to run a camping program? We talked to a community, you know, that small community like us is doing with grant funds. And they said, we don't know what's going to happen when the grants runs out because we can't do it. Um, so I think those are the kinds of things, you know, I talked to the pallet housing people and they're like, yeah, we're running into this all around. Um, so I, you know, 
it's just top of mind for everybody. It, I was going to do this in the manager's report, but just I'll do it right now since we're talking about this topic. Um, that group of communities is getting together again tomorrow to talk about next steps because um, until Representative Casey spoke today, we'd heard nothing from anybody, um, our own delegation or any state official or anybody about this issue. So, um, so if we were to try to schedule a meeting before our next scheduled meeting, which is October 9th, when, when would that be? And could we do could we do it in such a way that it actually produces something worthwhile? Um, we could do the second or the sixteenth. Second might be tight if we've got the LCT. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm I'm inclined to think that the sixteenth might be a better date because it gives us some time to prepare for it. Yeah, are are you all available on the sixteenth? An off week for us. All right, let's shoot for that. Bill and I will talk at our meeting next week, and Bill will be I'll working on that. Yep, with the structure. Okay, now with regard to the policy, is uh, are you all ready to move and vote? on this policy or do you want to wait and yes carrie if, if we were going to vote on it i would like to go back to this um section about alcohol being prohibited and that one feels to me like it's very specifically directed at um homeless people and camp you know, camping up there and um so i i would prefer it be consistent with hubbard park and say that you know whatever the the rules are for Hubbard Park that outside of designated areas or something like that, but just to have it be consistent because I I really don't want as Lauren was saying this policy to be sending the message that we don't nobody's allowed to camp there ever get out stay out. So this is a policy, not an ordinance, so it doesn't have to be quite as precise necessarily. So the policy might just say uh, consumption of alcohol is permitted consistent with that of other. Right. Well, other of Harvard Park, <laughs> for that mm -hmm. matter. You just say other park, we'll go out of Harvard Park. That sounds great. Is that a motion then, to amend it? Yes. Uh, yes. I would like to move to amend uh, number five to say, I mean, I don't think we have to say illegal drugs are prohibited because they're illegal. Because they're, they're illegal. Prohibited. <laughs> so I would amend number five in that section to say that consumption of alcohol is permitted in accordance with the same rules of matter is that separate and we got a second from sal any other discussion all those in favor signify by saying aye aye any opposed okay thanks folks is that just on the amendment or the whole thing Oh, right. Then we got to do the, that's just the amendment now. Uh, Second. Thank you, Bill. Um, is there a motion to adopt the policy with that amendment? So moved. Is there a second? All those, in, any discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right. Great. Thank you. Um, what I'd like to do is uh, take uh, take up uh, item eleven, the elevation fund elevation projects. I'd like to take that up uh, because I know we've got probably a couple of people here who are here specifically for that. Why make you wait till the till later in the meeting, um, Mike? Good evening, Mike Miller, Planning Director. Um, so we added this item really quickly uh, because uh, I guess it was Tuesday we received notice that the item we had been talking about for a long time, that the state had allocated money, $3 million 
uh, to Vermont Emergency Management for the purpose of elevating structures, uh, was eligible for a number of communities. We put together an application, we put that in, and we did get awarded yesterday. Uh, we don't have our contracts in place, we don't have our subgrants in place yet, but we've got notification of $900,000, which is uh, what they had penciled out for three building elevations. Um, we're going to hope to try to manage the money in such a way that maybe we can squeeze in a fourth or something else. But at this point, we're managing this as if it's three building elevations. The priorities that they gave us were that uh, we had to first prioritize substantially damaged structures uh, that are not in the buyout program. So just a refresher, we had four substantially damaged structures. Three of them are in the buyouts. So the one person uh, is Lisa, who she's been online. She's here. Um, she is uh, the one who would uh, basically land as the, the number one. She would be the priority based on the fact that she is the only substantially damaged structure um, that qualifies for building elevations. So the question that Josh and I have for you today is, we don't want to drag this process out. We don't want to make this take any longer than it has to. We'd rather get this this process moving. It's always slow to get these things moving. Um, but we'd like to come up with a way of being able to prioritize those other two structures. So we had a list of 10 or 12. Some of them, uh, as we mentioned, were are in the buyout program, so they're not eligible. But we did um, put together a really quick uh, matrix. Josh and I talked about some, how would we score these in some way? And what we uh, look back on were, what are the structures that are most likely to flood? So who is the farthest under for, if you're first, look at your first floor, you're under the base flood elevation because you're flooding. So those, we would go with the worst and work our way back up. And in those cases, uh, that would be the property at 201 State. So if you were going down State Street, you have that group of eight buildings before you get to the cemetery. You can have some buildings, some trees, then you have the eight buildings, and then it gets to the cemetery. The last of those before you're on that stretch is 201. Uh, they are the farthest. Um, they're at approximately 2.9 feet under base flood elevation. So if they get a 100-year flood, they're under about three feet of water into their first floor. Uh, the second property would be at 309 state would be our recommendation for the second, um, property that is, uh, if you've been here long enough, that's the old toy town motel. It's been converted into three, uh, three apartments. That's on the other side of the cemetery on state street. Um, the other advantage on that property is that property owner's done a lot of work and already actually has plans in place to elevate the building. Uh, they just haven't been able to move the project forward. Um, and then after that, if you were to follow that formula, we would then be having two properties on Elm Street, 117 Elm, 120 Elm. And then we would be back for the last property on State Street, 191 State Street. So of the six that we evaluated, there are other properties, but we know those are higher. So if we eventually had enough money to get to a seventh and eighth and ninth, we could go through and start evaluating other buildings, but it doesn't seem likely with our funding that we'll get much past the first three or four. So we just wanted to get an approval that using this type of formula would be the best approach to um, equitably distribute this money going forward. Yep. Thanks, Mike. This is good to uh jump put this together so quickly yeah thanks to josh yeah. he did all the work <laughs> were, were were there other uh criteria that you considered building into the uh into the scoring matrix that uh, we should be aware of we had thought about you know homesteads or uh occupancy uh some of these are rental properties some of these may have been home home occup you know owner occupied um, so we tried to go and factor some of those in. For the most part, these these are um, partially they're they're you know the question of is it a vacant property or is it not a vacant property is is one you know um, is it owner occupied is it rental occupied we decided not to make a decision based on that we didn't want to discriminate against renters by going and saying well we're going to favor the homeowners because that's we we that we took that off, we just went with 
whatever's the first ones to flood, we just kind of felt that was the the most equitable. But obviously, you could come up with different formulas to put scoring points in. Thanks. And it seems like using the uh, the lowest properties property as a as the main criterion or only criterion gets us like the biggest bang for our buck, right? Protects the most vulnerable. Yeah, it's starting with the most vulnerable and working our way back up. Lauren. Uh, thanks. First of all, very excited to see this moving forward. Yeah. It can come soon enough. Um, one question, I guess just one other criteria that comes to mind, like you mentioned, like Lisa's unit is unit it, like has a rental unit. So that's two, I think, housing units, yes. if I'm remembering right. And then you mentioned the other one has uh, multiple units, like I guess multiple housing units also seems like a valuable, just knowing yep. the shortage. And I don't know if that was. Yeah, it, it it could be a factor. In this case, the the our recommended second one has two dwelling units and our recommended third one has three dwelling units before it gets back to the the Elm Street properties, which are single family homes, one owner occupied, one currently vacant at this time. Okay. Anybody else? Any comments from or questions from any uh, anyone who's here in the room? Ed, why don't you yeah. please step up? Well, that's fine, but uh, but the public needs to hear what you. you're saying too. Ed Haggett, one ninety seven, one ninety nine will be raised. 195 will be raised. Um, I feel like I've lived 25 years in the past 14 months. I've met many people. I cherish my two council representatives. Um, I met with Senator Welch for over an hour, and he was really, really interesting. And I think he was instrumental in getting VEM to move. What I'm frightened of right now is I'm so happy for Lisa and I'm so happy for the elevations. What happens if we don't get the buyouts? Are we like done? Are we over? When we've not knowing what to do for the 14 months, we've gone ahead and it's not like we've been sitting on our hands doing nothing. We have made choices and changes without any background information to do it based on what we need and, and research. So, you know, I'm going to go, I mean, I just filed my mortgage papers today when I didn't have a mortgage with Montpelier and Barry. Um, and so my hope being that the, buyout would help us. But because we chose buyout, we're not eligible for... No so, our, mm -hmm. so my question, I'm scared to death. You know, my question is, what happens if buyouts don't happen? So I, I know people won't have answers for that. But we might, it might do have any answers. I might rely a little bit on Josh for this with these guys first. Yeah. Um, I guess I haven't heard anything from VEM who hasn't heard anything from FEMA that would indicate that the buyouts that we have put forward are going to get denied. Um, at least two of them, Ed's and uh, Katie Swick's on Elm Street, have gotten to the point where FEMA has given us sort of like an update like in their process of in indicating that they're almost done, their review. Um, we've not gotten that with Mary's, but I, I suspect that we will at some point fairly soon. Um, so again, like we don't, we don't know what's in store. We don't know how long that notice to proceed is going to be issued, but VM has not indicated that they believe FEMA is going to deny these buyouts. They're all substantially damaged. We're not dealing with a benefit cost analysis calculation. So that's good. FEMA already considers it to be a good deal to buy these properties out. So um, I, I feel I'm pretty confident that everything is going to happen. Thanks, Josh. Any 
other questions or comments from council or from members of the public online? So, uh, are there any? Are there? Is there a time limit on, or a deadline on when we need to spend this nine hundred thousand dollars? December twenty six. Yeah, December twenty six is when we're supposed to have it all expended in the home. Yeah, so we're as we said, we've and we'll have a couple of steps that we have to take along the way. We do have to still work with the state to get an approval. Um, when we go and say we're prioritizing these. We haven't yet sat down with the property owners to go through and say, we now have it. Are you still interested in going forward? We would still have to have the state come in and do the flood state floodplain manager come in and take a look at the building to make sure it is elevatable, <laughs> able to be elevated. Mm -hmm. So uh, we, we have a few steps. Historic preservation has to sign off on things. We've got to get uh, elevation plans drawn up and get those approved. There are a lot of steps we have to do before we can kind of jump in. This just gives us the ability to start moving moving down based on the priority list. But, but some of those steps spend this money. Yes, yeah, some of that like, would spend this money. And now, um, remember also, we had been talking in the past a lot about we can't spend money until we have authorization. There's a whatever, a, a term. We now have that authorization. We can't get reimbursed, but we could spend money. And when we're ready, we can get reimbursed. So we are now eligible to be spending money. Um, so that's what we're, um, that, that's why if we get this, we then have the authority to start spending money. Um, we will get reimbursed. Adrian. Thank you. I know this, <laughs> there was a whole like excitement about this when this came through. So. And there's a lot of questions, which is, you know, anticipated because now it's like, well, now what? We're so excited. Thank you all for, you know, obviously working so hard to get this money. It was, man, I don't even, I mean, probably hours and hours and hours to lobby and, and get this through. So thank you all for, for making this happen for our homeowners that have lived in unbelievable situations for the past 15 months. Um, and so one of the concerns, which... I know I've heard was the, um, I don't know what the word, the availability or securing of contractors. And so, you know, what does the timeline look like for all that work, that list you just said, and then what is the timeline for securing a contractor? So the work, can we guarantee that this, the elevations will happen in 2025, kind of working backwards, right? So all this work has to happen then when do we secure a contractor and how do we kind of make sure that we secure that contractor before they book their schedules for 2025 i'm sure it's a little bit of a chicken versus egg here but i don't i want to i don't want to miss that window and have to go into 2026 so i don't know if you know those like answers but that's like what's on my mind of like ah. and that's one reason why when we heard on tuesday we asked bill to put this on to ask the mayor to put this on for tonight so we don't have to wait three weeks for another council meeting we we just we want we don't want to wait three more weeks to have um this discussion um but there'll be two key points that we won't have control over one is we're going to need to get engineer drawings for the foundation work if we can get engineering firms um to do those and do those quickly. We obviously have a budget, we can do it. Um, we just have to find someone to do it. If nobody can do it, that kind of puts us into a, into a predicament because we can't get authorization to go to the next step, which is to put out the RFP to elevate the house until we have the approved plans. So that will be the one piece. So let's say we do very quickly, we find somebody, they're willing to do the work, we get it, we've got these plans, we've got them approved, now we put out an RFP, we now need to find the elevation folks. We don't know at this time, we have contacts, we've made a number of contacts with folks that said they still have openings in 2025. So, but you know, that's, that's one firm, how quickly do they book out? How quickly can we get those? Um, so, there are things out of our control. The things in our control are what we're going to be working on next, which is to get get those elevation certificates, get those engineered drawings, start communicating and getting agreements with the property owners, um, get those reviews at the state so that way we're ready as quickly as we can um, to get to that last step, which is get that RFP out so we can get a proposal, so we can get interested 
folks and hopefully everything all comes in under budget, which it should hopefully. Lauren. Is, is there an ability to give a heads up that the state money's come through to the contractors that we know just like we're working through the process, but like, like let us know if you're filling up and like, in case like there's any expediting, <laughs> like just put us, put us in your, in your radar. It, I don't know we'll do what we can. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, we, 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 it'll be an RFP process. So unfortunately we can't, you know, pre-select anybody and, um, but we'll work through, we'll see what, what comes out. We do have uh, DPW does have a process, which maybe we can be able to work into where they have pre-approved contractors. If we can find somebody within that, that saves us having to go through an RFP process, but we'll be working with DPW and we'll be keeping you in the loop as to where things are with these various projects. And, and Mike, to be clear on what you're asking for tonight, you read off a list of properties that you anticipate to be done and in the order to be uh, to be done. But I think what you're saying is that you want the council to approve the the standard by that you would apply to uh, to select the properties to be elevated. Yes. That that would be our that's what we're asking for. It's just so we know which ones, how do we prioritize so that way if next week we're talking to one of the ones that are have been selected and they say, you know what, we're really not interested in doing this, we can automatically jump to number four. We don't have to come back to to say, who would you guys like to add? We can just automatically jump to the next one. Or if the state comes in and says this building isn't eligible for X reason, we can just move on to the next person and I think that's good because I I would that feels a lot better to me than saying, yes, approve Mr. X and Mrs. Y and so forth. That doesn't seem like the way we want to be proceeding. Terry, were you starting to say something? Okay, so. So so what are those criteria? We, we talked about uh, buildings that flood first. Lauren talked about multiple units. Are those equally weighted or, I mean, how? We just went, and on ours, we just went, uh, number one was substantially damaged, which sure. was set. So that's Lisa's yeah. property and that's in. And then after that, it is based on, um, the most vulnerable based on the first floor elevation of the building. And they, and they, the first two in line just happened to be multiple units. And the first two just happened to be and multiple units. And the rest units. are single, single family. Uh, well, Thank there's you. the next two. So the next two on Elm Street are single family. And then the sixth property is a four unit. All right. Is there a motion to do that? Perhaps a council member from that district. <laughs> Lauren. Um, I move that we uh, direct or what? Do you want to say what you want us to do? <laughs> like exactly? I don't know if we wrote it out yeah, in our, in our... to the recommended criteria from the planning department regarding. Building elevations. Building Re elevations for the VEM funding. Is that good enough for you, Mike? Does that get what you need? Uh, oh, you didn't. Do you have thought? Did you have a draft? I, I didn't have a. So, have how about we? Yeah, you move to approve the expenditure of these grant funds and to uh, allocate these based on uh, flood reverse. Flood elevation or yeah, flood risk, flood vulnerability, flood vulnerability. Oh, yep, there we go. Very, uh, but the first there were two, it was two parts, right? The first was substantially damaged. So that was the state's criteria. That's so that's, that's the state said it has to be substantially okay. damaged, and it has to not be in the buyout program. So those are that already close to one. And okay, is there a second? Second. Good risk. Any further discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Any opposed? All right. This just I know that you'd offered like public comment in the room, just so, like I know Lisa's on. Like I don't know if we'd offer Yeah, I, I did ask for that. Oh, okay, too. I yeah. missed that. Sorry. Make sure. Okay, thanks, Mike. Oh, well, this is this is a great day. Um, 
Number nine, financial reports. I was thinking, can we get this in before our break at 8.30 versus do I want to make you wait until after? And so come on up, Sarah. All right. Well, we're thanks, Ed. thanks, Ed. Well, given what Zach said about making our meeting shorter, which which people never complain about, <laughs> you're up. Hi, so Sarah LaCroix, Finance Director. I'm here to present the fiscal year 2020 tour, excuse me, 2024 financial report. Um, at this point, this report is unaudited, um, but I am pretty confident that it is close to what um, final will look like. Um, I do have a few disclaimers, just that these, as I said, these results are preliminary across all funds for the operations of this year. Um, as I said, there are minor adjustments that are currently ongoing, but I don't expect significant changes. Uh, again, unaudited. The auditors are on site this week. They started Monday. They have been here um, picking everything apart, asking questions. Um, they'll continue to audit remotely after that. It's our expectation we'll get the report um, at the end of December to be able to present to council in January, um, which is in line with our typical practice. Last year was an anomaly with the flood and the delay. Um, so this is just a quick all funds summary, um, outlining what you'll see in the financial report, showing the surplus and shortfall across all funds. Um, I will talk about the general and enterprise funds later, but I wanted to note um, the cemetery fund is showing a small shortfall. Um, revenues came in under budget and salary and wages came in over budget, which contributed to that. Um, the parks fund is also showing a deficit. Um, this is primarily related to the transfer out of the bond proceeds that were sitting in that fund related to Confluence Park. So we've just relocated those to the capital fund after council's decision. We wanted to make sure we um, trued up the parks fund to, to remove the, that funding. Um, and then both the rec fund um, and the senior center fund came out ahead. Um, the recreation fund did that even with having $40,000 reduced from their appropriation, um, as well as cost saving measures allowed them to come out um, to the good 26,000. And then the senior center fund has investment funds that are performing very well um, that we're seeing reflected in their increase. Um, so to talk about the general fund, um, it's no surprise that this was a very difficult year. I'm happy to sit up here and report that there is a surplus of $297,000, um, give or take minor, minor audit adjustments. Um, there were several things that impacted this year. The reappraisal that was completed for 2023's grand list. Um, there were grievance hearings by the Board of Civil Authority that resulted in tax revenue loss, as well as appeals to reappraisal after the Board of Civil Authority that led to more tax revenue loss. Um, 11 days into the fiscal year, we were hit with the flood and sustained a lot of damage to city infrastructure. We established a deficit mitigation plan that you um, all approved in October of 23. And then we lobbied hard during the legislative session, session for financial relief to try to offset some of the burden we were facing with the unknowns and the, the abatement loss. Um, so just to talk a little bit about the deficit mitigation plan, um, at the time that loss was unknown, uh, my nature is to be conservative. Um, and because we didn't know, I estimated a shortfall of 1.5 million that needed to be mitigated. 
Uh, we were expecting a significant downturn in meals and rooms tax with the businesses closing the downtown. We expected department fees to take a big hit. And then we really had no idea what property taxes would look like because we had the reappraisal and then we would have abatements. And so the approach we took was to take, I took the map and I took all of the properties in the downtown and I estimated, you know, 50% that they could be. And so that was kind of where we got to the 1.5 million we were trying to mitigate. Uh, we propose cost saving measures to, excuse me, only make purchases necessary to operation and already under contract. We tried to cut costs across all departments. We held positions vacant. We didn't fund Country Club Road. We reduced our capital funding, but since we're able to restore after we saw how everything came out, um, we were able to fully fund capital, which does give us a little bit of a buffer and start to build a reserve for our, our high capital needs. And maybe we can do more paving or more projects in the future with funding that we have sitting there, um, given the pinch I expect we'll feel um, coming into the next budget cycle. Um, we also proposed repurposing committed fund balance and ARPA funds, but we didn't end up needing to utilize that. So um, I was pleased to see that outcome as well. Um, it's just an outline about the tax revenue. It came in approximately $400,000 under budget. I want to note that those numbers don't total $400,000. Um, there were other minor um, pieces in there, but I just, I can do math. That does not add. Um, <laughs> but so we had a lot of reappraisal grievances that there were about 69, I think the Board of Civil Authority heard, and that resulted in $84,645 in um, tax revenue loss. Um, because those were all heard before January, I believe, 15th, we were able to refile the grant list with the state. And so we didn't have to eat the education taxes on those that that was trued up through that. So that was awesome. Um, but with the reappraisal appeals, the same wasn't applicable. Um, so we did have appeals that were after the grievance hearings in the Board of Civil Authority. And those came in at 60,120 in municipal tax loss. Um, as I noted below, there was also 74,000 in education tax that we were unable to collect, but we still owed to the school. Um, so that money didn't come in, but I did have to pay the school that money. Um, I have requested reimbursement from the state, but it is a $1 million pool annually. So they have to wait until all other municipalities have submitted. And if we have any more appeals that come through to submit, um, we could get all of it. We could get a prorated share of it. I don't know. Um, so at this point, that's unknown. Um, we abated municipal taxes to the amount of 162,012. Um, so we took that hit as well. We also abated 204,000 in education taxes, but luckily also with the Budget Adjustment Act, they covered that. So they reduced our share of what was due to the school. Um, so that was incredibly helpful. Um, and then given all of the flooding and um, issues people had, our delinquent tax list did grow significantly this year. So that is an, an impact to the bottom line because that was tax revenue we didn't yet collect, but hopefully we'll collect in a future year. Um, so that being said, um, I expect that there will be additional tax abatement requests that linger from the flood that, you know, there's no statute of limitations. They can come ask for them anytime. That will be something that will impact our fund balance and bottom line. And I would expect the next few fiscal years possibly. And then there are still outstanding appeals on the reappraisal. Um, when those come back, um, there will be um, true up with that. We will owe municipal tax back to those people um, as well as the education tax plus interest. Um, and then we would still apply for the education portion to be um, reimbursed by the state. But again, that's a, a big unknown at this point. Um, we also received 825,000 in Budget Adjustment Act funds. Um, of those, 395,000 were put to the general fund to offset the deficit, and another 100,000 were placed there to go into the fund balance for the Montpelier Commission on Recovery and Resilience in the future. Um, the remainder of those funds were put to the parking fund and other projects that council approved. I want to say it was in June or July. Um, so I just wanted to give a quick over the last three years, what the net impact of our fund balance or to our fund balance has been, um, you know, we had, we came out ahead this year, you know, we did a lot of cost saving measures and then, you know, that money from the state really helped to make us whole. And I think that this surplus going into fund balance, you know, helps for the future with, um, 
you know, one, meeting our policy or getting closer to our policy, but two, any future abatements, this is there as a cushion for that. Um, but you can see over the last three years, you know, the net impact to fund balance, while they were big swings, net to eighty six hundred dollars. Um, they were they were not easy years by any means. And I missed twenty two, but boy, twenty three and twenty four were a ride. Um, <laughs> um, so, but that's uh, jokes aside. The general fund assigned, assigned balance is now up to one point two million. Um, our policy threshold of 15% of budgeted general fund expenditures would make us need to have about 2.6. Um, that is a lofty goal from my past experience. I, you know, not a lot of municipalities with budgets our size get a fund balance that big. So I am pleased with the halfway there. Um, uh, just briefly on the enterprise funds, you'll see the water fund and the sewer fund came with a surplus um, usage Revenue and benefit charges came in over budget in the water fund, so that helped attribute to that. And then the sewer fund received a $675,000 grant for sewer improvements, um, which is what's, I don't want to say misleading, but it's making it look like they have a big surplus. Um, it is for expenses that were capitalized. It's just not how it shows here. Um, then the parking fund, you know, we, I estimated we would be between 215 and 265 in um, shortfall for that fund. With the 215 in there, we came in about $8,800 um, as a shortfall. So that really helped the parking fund. And hopefully we can course correct this year um, and people come back and are paying for parking and, and that revenue returns. And then District T operates at a loss annually. That's a hot button topic. It's usually about $180,000 related to depreciation, but this year it was less because we deferred maintenance costs while we were focused on flood recovery. There were some state adjustments and just lower plant operating costs that contributed to that. Um, just a brief overview of the ARPA fund. You guys have heard this before. We received 2.2 million. This has all been allocated. Uh, we have expended 1.1 as the end of at the end of FY24. More has been spent since, and we will be sure to make it spent by December 31st, so there's no risk of having to return funds. And then the FEMA fund. Um, this is my living nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> we have spent $1.9 million thus far. Um, we have gotten insurance proceeds, but our FEMA reimbursements to date are few and far between. Um, it is a very difficult process. I am on it and working it and I will get us our money back, but it is tough. Um, and I expect this will be a long recovery um, for us. Just a bit about the funding structure right now, it's federal 75%, state 17 and a half and city seven and a half. And so I expect that once FEMA has obligated enough money to reach the 90% threshold, it will become 90% federally funded. And then the state and local or state and our share will adjust accordingly. Um, my hope is we land somewhere around three to 4% um, on the hook for our total costs. Uh, I also took out a $6 million flood recovery line of credit. We have not had to draw on that yet. Um, it does have a high interest rate. So my hope is not to have to draw on it, but if we do, um, it is that interest is eligible um, for permanent projects to be reimbursed by FEMA. So some of that carrying costs will be covered. And then we took out a $2.1 million um, loan from the Vermont Bond Bank's Municipal Climate Resiliency Fund um, with a really low interest rate, which has really helped plug the gap while we wait for FEMA funding and are still incurring um, costs. Um, and they will start to ramp up as we get, you know, into some of these bigger projects. Hey, Sarah, just a quick question on the line of credit. If we had to use it, does the uh, decision last week by the Fed to cut interest rates, uh, will, will that flow through to the rate we've had? No. At? Oh, well. Uh, the, <laughs> the line of credit, I want to say I took that out in December, um, so that will be coming up for renewal. So we... I think it would be in our best interest to go out to bid again um, <laughs> to make sure we keep the line of credit for when we do start ramping up um, projects without FEMA funding. Uh, they will have funding, but without FEMA funding yet. Okay, thanks. Uh, 
So then just in summary, uh, incredibly difficult year, but we did our best to reduce the impact. And I do think a lot of the things we did um, really helped, you know, we, with the lobbying of the state, only four funds showing shortfalls and all of our flood recovery. You know, I think this is the best we could have hoped for out of a bad year. Um, and I, like I said, I expect we will see a little bit more pain um, that carries from this year, um, but I hope that that doesn't have a huge impact. Thanks, Sarah. This is great. Um, Lauren. Just first of all, thank you. Like great, clear presentation and just the management of this, like from you and your team and, you know, obviously from leadership on down and then just like every department that has chipped into making this happen and like getting us to this point. So just sincere gratitude to every city staff member who's helped put us in this position to have this kind of report after the kind of year that we've had. It's really impressive and just very grateful. Would put in a little plug of what was it, fifteen thousand dollar lobbying investment that helped. And like I I wanna yes, I wanted to be put sure it on the table to, that we uh, fund that again with a very clear gonna, mandate to to keep bringing the money in. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't gonna let this go by without tipping the cap to that. Sure. Thank you to our it, lobbyists. It was what a 40 to 40 to one return, something, something like that. that. Well, that was just that one. We got some money. Plus yeah. we got we got a thousand dollars, right? That yep. Mm -hmm. Just allocated. So anyone else? All right. Thanks a lot, Sarah. Um yeah, I'd just like to offer my thanks to um Sarah and the whole team. Um it really I never dreamed we'd be sitting here telling you we finished here with a three hundred thousand dollar to the good we were we were hoping we would just make it like zero and you remember yeah. last year was seven hundred and fifty thousand to the bad so um yeah great job all the way around and and and, I, and when you say that you can't underscore the importance of that eight hundred and twenty five thousand dollars in in this mix right i mean that really is the the big difference so hats off to all involved in that and especially Maggie Lenz and Leonine for their work on that and the prior item as well, the flood elevations and our whole team that went up and so before we move job. before we move off this, Joe, I see you have your hand up. Yeah. Um Joe Castellano of Saban Street, waiting for the video to come on. I go. just have one quick question. Now, I know that you discussed the tax abatements, and I understand that um, the National Life has uh, received an abatement, and I think it's currently out on appeal. Now, is that reflected in your figure? Uh, National Life did not receive an abatement, um, and their appeal has since been decided. Um, that is the amount that's listed in the appeals section of my presentation. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah, it's the distinction between an appeal of the assessment, which leads to a, a change in the tax revenue generated and an abatement where we decide to forego re taxes that were, were due. And I, while we're passing out thanks to people, um, I cannot thank enough all the members of the Board of Civil Authority and Board of Abatement for all the hundreds of hours they put in over the uh, course of last year. Uh, Councillor Heaney said it was a living hell last week, uh, or last meeting, and it was it was a lot of work, and people really put in the time to do that. All right, let's uh, do the resolution to commit funds, if that's best, and then we'll take our break, even though we're a little, little past 8.30. Uh, yep. So I'm the resolution to commit funds as well. Uh, this could have been a consent agenda item, but I felt it was prudent to share the financial status with you all before um, you reviewed and approved this. So I don't have a presentation. It is the resolution that's in the packet. Um, the majority of these items are restricted in nature, either by grants or donations, but there are a few like the HRA reserve, which I think is really important um, given some of the health insurance increases I expect we'll face um, in the upcoming years to keep, um, as well as a reserve to offset the district heat liability. Um, most of these are restricted in nature, but this is a uh, something we do every year to commit and provide this to the auditors so that um, if you have questions, I'm happy to answer them. And so what you're looking for is someone to move 
the resolution that is in the packet. Yes, please. Is there a motion? Sure. Um, I will move to approve the resolution to commit funds dated June 30, 2024. Is any discussion? Any questions for Sarah? All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right. Thanks. Thanks, Sarah. Now we will take our 10-minute uh, break. Thank you for bearing with us, folks. We are um, now back in, in business after a brief uh, internet uh, loss. So we're up to item number 12, Housing Committee re Reduction in Size. Josh, and is that why you're here too, Stan? Great. Uh, great, Josh Drown, Planning Department. <clears throat> um, two weeks ago, uh, we brought to you for your consideration a reduction of the Housing Committee size uh, from its current 12 members. Um, and um, the Housing Committee has had a meeting now. Remember, we, they couldn't actually have a vote themselves because they had were having issues meeting quorum, but we were able to get a special meeting done on the fourth try. Um, and voted to um, to make a recommendation uh, to council to reduce the size from 12 to the original size of 11. Um, that that way, it reduces that quorum number from seven to six. They gained one new member in Harry Sun, um, and so and we've been um, offered an owl by Orca to use in our meeting. So. Um, the hybrid format will create a, a, a better um, uh, platform for committee member participation. So that should increase um, the likelihood of re reaching quorum. Um, but we they, they still wanted to reduce that size to the original 11. Great. Any questions from any members of the council? Stan, do you have anything to add? Uh, no, so Stan Brinkerhoff, um, I'm on the committee. Our, our chair couldn't make it today. Uh, as Josh mentioned, we did vote to approve this request um, as a group. It was the fourth evening uh, we tried this. So uh, it's critically needed. It, it's needed for us to meet our business. And um, we certainly appreciate the community feedback that there's work to do and we should grow the committee. Um, and we're looking forward to finding that growth in the future. But for now, we really need to be able to operate with a quorum that's a little bit smaller. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Is there a motion to approve the this uh, action? Lauren. Um, I move we reduce the size of the city's housing committee to 11 seats. Is there a second? Any discussion? Um, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Thanks. Next. All right. Oh, no. CJAC's in between. Right. Next up, uh, CJAC composition and charge. Who's on char in charge of this? Kelly? Everyone, I'm just going to tee this up and um, play out uh, Councillor Brown can. Um, Take it the rest of the way. Um, so in your agenda packet, we um, had a couple of recommendations for CJAC, um, the Social Economic Justice Advisory Committee. Um, there has not been a quorum for quite some time. And also there's um, you know some question about charge. Um, so we wanted to take the opportunity to have a conversation. And so the language that is in the cover sheet was just a, um, suggested proposal. However, in front of you um, at your seats, there is some additional language for charge um, that I think is more pertinent um, and is recommended from the committee. Um, so take a look at that. And then um, the other thing that we're requesting is that um, the committee be reduced from nine seats to five. And I'm happy to read the charge language if that's helpful or not, or I'll just turn it over. 
Well, we have it in writing in front of us, Carrie. Yes, thank you. Um, so I'm I'm a council member representative on this committee, so I can speak to it. Um, and yeah, so the committee has been pretty small for a while. We've been not able to have a quorum for quite a long time, which has really impacted our ability to get anything done. Um, in addition, the charge was um, it was broad. It was kind of sprawling and comprehensive, but at the same time needed some tightening up and some clarification. And so you all have language that is the suggested language for a new charge that came from the committee. And I mean, I think I might just read. Um, it's three points. Identify and nurture projects that address systemic oppression in the municipality in line with the city council's strategic plan equity goals. Collaborate with city councilors, city committee members and city staff to support them in centering the experiences of oppressed groups and individuals as they consider policy and decisions regarding city operations. And engage city residents and other groups to identify actions to address in incidences or structures of harm and oppression by the city to raise to city council or city staff as needed. And so the idea behind these items was to um, uh, to try not to be saying that the committee is going to be taking on the responsibility of making Montpelier a welcoming place for everybody to live, but that the committee is going to be finding uh, projects to suggest, to support, finding, uh, be able to provide input to city council and to city staff as they're developing policies and making decisions. Um, as the committee has weighed in recently a couple of times on the responsible employer ordinance and um and the uh and the the city bot proposal and language access um so we would like to continue being able to do things like that and still have the room for suggesting the launch of a giant initiative that you know we could get a lot of funding for or anything in between so I would like to move that the Social and Economic Justice Advisory Committee be reduced in size to five members plus one city council member, and that the charge be revised to reflect this wording that I just read out loud. Is there a second? Any discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thanks, Carrie. Item 14, Housing Trust Fund Request. Good evening again. <laughs> it's been a while. Familiar faces. <laughs> Uh, it's Stan Brinkerhoff uh, here on behalf of the, the Housing Committee. Um, one of the Housing Committee's charges is to ensure that we help meet in any way we can the, the city's master plan of uh, ensuring we have adequate uh, supply of safe, resilient housing to meet all current and future needs. Um, we put together a revisement of the Housing Trust Fund guidelines really this year, I believe July. Uh, we released an RFP asking for proposals for that. I believe in the packet you have in front of you today, uh, Josh has provided two applications from Downstreet, one for a project on Heaton Street, which would be uh, four standalone homes that would be owned by the occupants and forever affordable, and uh, a, a renovations of a four-unit apartment building on Hubbard Street in Montpelier. Um, I think you know, these, these are key projects to Montpelier, bringing housing ties into so many of the other discussions we're having, right? The lack of adequate supply is driving uh, demand in Montpelier. It's driving prices. It's driving uh, our inability for folks to find housing. Our committee took these and um, uh, unanimously approved these. They will bring, on, in very short order, online four uh, four houses with families and four apartments in in the situation where we, we need them. Um, and so, you want to help me a little bit with? Yeah, I guess you know the the request um, uh, from Down Street is one hundred thousand for the four unit rehab on Hubbard Street, currently a vacant structure, um, and so that 
is in partnership with Central Vermont Re Refugee Action Network, uh, where CB RAN will be uh, um, finding uh, refugee families in that unit. And if there are no refugee families, then it uh, goes to Down Street um, for their um, clients in their pipeline. Um, and then the Heat Street project is for single family residences that'll be net zero, um, created out of a subdivision. They're working with Washington County Mental Health Services right there on a the subdivision right now. Um, and both projects, um, you know, if funded with this, this funding, can move forward fairly quickly. So the rehab is intended to begin this fall um, and be finished by early next spring um, and intended to, um, you know, first half of next year. Um, and then the single family uh, project on Heaton Street would be finished, I think, uh, the end of next year. Um, and Nic Nicola Anderson from Down Street is also online um, if, if she wants to include anything or if you have any questions. But I think that sums up both projects. 80,000 for the Heaton Street project, 100,000 for the Hubbard Street project. Uh, so $180,000 in total. And it still leaves us almost a hundred thousand in the trust fund balance. Um, am I right that the Heaton Street project is uh, targeted to employees of Washington County Mental Health? Um, Nicola, can you handle that? Yeah, it's not. Um, we can. It's not just targeted solely to employees there. I think definitely uh, we're. You know, we've talked to Washington County Mental Health. And are checking in with our funders to see if we can provide preference. Um, but we will definitely market um, these units to the employees in Washington County Mental Health Services. Thanks. And they, those four units, actually, I think they would be done before the end of next year. And excitedly, just to share about the four single-family homes, we were one of three nationwide awards uh, for that uh, project. And this is kind of the first project for um, Downstreet doing single family modular home development for home ownership. And we're trying to reciprocate that in Waitsfield and in Barrie too. But this is gonna be that first project um, to kind of create this model in other uh, towns in central Vermont. Any other questions? Is there a motion to approve this uh, request? Or is it two requests, or should we approve them together? I think you can approve them together. Okay. They're in one action item. Is there a motion to approve this? Lauren. I move that we approve the Housing Committee and Planning Department recommendation to fund the requests made by Downstreet Housing and Community Development for their Hubbard Street and Heaton Street projects. Is the second. Any discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. aye. Any opposed? All right, thank you. I think this is great. Thank you. <laughs> Eight new units of housing for, for our city, that's great. All right, next up, Public Arts Commission. Item number 15. I got it. Nope, I got it. Oh, God. Great. Yep. Actually, here. Yep, double click. Okay, that's zoom is on share. Oh, you guys can't look behind. Oh, you you've got it on your screens? Yes. Oh, that's so convenient. Awesome pictures. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Good evening. I'm Ward Joyce. I'm the chair of the Public Arts Commission. I was here a year ago asking for authorization to do the projects that we had in mind for 2023 and we got that authorization and a month ago we voted as a commission to support three projects that i'm back to seek your support of and i have a very short presentation but i'll take you through it the public ooh, that's too fast the public public arts commission 
um, was founded in 2019. Um, the three projects that we're seeking authorization to spend on is an award for a building owner's matching grant for two large building murals. I'll show you them in a minute. Um, <clears throat> the Public Arts Commission would like to contribute 10,000 and the building owner would contribute 13, which is part of our charge to leverage public or private money to get public art done. The second project is that we would like to support Montpelier Lives Project, which is Lighting the Bridges Project, <clears throat> because we feel that public art is not only exciting for residents, but we think that this Lighting the Bridges Project uh, could well be a uh, really significant project for the city, kind of, an, uh, I wouldn't say a world-class, but let's just say a nation-class project. I'll show you an image of that in a minute, but um, the Public Arts Commission would like to support this exciting project that's well underway. And then we have 35 pieces of public art in the city that we take care of, and we only have about six of them signed, mm -hmm. which is to say identifying the artists, identifying the sponsors, and explaining the piece. And we would like to finish the signage on as many of the pieces as we can this year. It's only about $150 a sign, but times 30 pieces, it's about $5,000. So we have available funds of about 27,000 and these three requests represent 25. So well within the money that we've um, been taking care of for the last three years. Uh, let me just tell you quickly what we've accomplished in this last year. Uh, the clothespin sculpture, which hopefully you've all seen over on the front of the Heaney lot, was put in with no funding from the city. That was all private funding from the Rotary, but we coordinated it, we permitted it, and helped install it. Um, we commissioned two new murals in the Gateway um, Mural Park, which I'll show you in a minute. Um, two $1,500 murals that are very large and we think have a pretty good splash. We replaced the panels over here in front of the drawing board, five panels that each year are done by high school students. Actually, there's, I think, eight, four sides times four, I think, or maybe two sides times five. There might be 10 of them. Um, we did five of the 31 signs this year, and um, we we intend to award two grants for the, the large murals that I'll show you in a minute, and we'd like to support lighting the bridges. And then we're also charged with maintaining all of the artwork in town, including in this case, putting up anti-graffiti coatings on all eight of the new murals we did. Sorry that I don't have an in situ photograph, but this is the piece that was just put on State Street. That was a $20,000 piece that the city paid nothing to have put there, which is good leveraging of um, public financing, otherwise known as zero. This is one of the two murals that got put into the um, Gateway Mural Park. The second one is this one, big pieces, like 20 feet tall. So now there's four that we funded in the last two years. Um, okay, and then um, signage. So in conclusion, coming back, 10,000 for the, the murals that I'm about to show you, 10,000 for supporting Montpelier Lives Project, and then five for signage. And then here are the two murals that we intend to commission. Um, they're both on properties owned by um, Jesse Jacobs, the back corner of the red brick building on state, and then the back side of, um, what's it called now? That one's on the corner of Langdon and Elm. Yeah, Langdon and Elm, um, the bent nail. Thank you. Struggling to do that. These are going to be the biggest murals in the city and we're very pleased that for $10,000 a contribution, we can get $23,000 worth of murals. The Lighting the Bridge project is characterized by this sort of um, imagery where they intend to light all seven of the trestle bridges, which I think will be you know, an outstanding project. And then this is an example of the signage that we have produced at about $150 a sign that um, identifies each of the artworks in town, calls out the name, who did it, who sponsored it, um, and a description of the piece. And as you know, the commission is made up of the seven of us. And I want to make one more point that the public art master plan called for about $50,000 of city support each year. And we have been given 45 in five years. So I just want to warn you that I will come back in the spring and see if we could perhaps get $20,000 out. 
I know it's been a rough five years for the city. I'll um, just mention, if you want to get money into the city budget, don't be coming to us in the spring. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, I was going to say this. He'll stuff. help us with that. Yeah, that's that's yeah. Josh's. Josh's. Um, Josh helps us with that stuff. So I just wanted to point out that um, that what we've accomplished for forty five, I think, has been noticeable, and we'd love to keep up the work that we're doing. Well, this is great. Any comments or questions? Oh, I mean, this is great. <laughs> Public art does have a big impact, I yeah. think. So, yeah. uh, so where do the, these two large murals are on the? Um, they're both one's visible, one's visible from Langdon Street and Elm, on the back of the of the corner building on State Street. Yes, they're both. I would say they're both pretty Elm Street. And one's visible from Elm Street on the back yeah. of, of Bent Nail. Yep. Building. If you come in Elm Street, to be in the back of Bent Nails, you come a block further. And it's a 45 degree corner of the big red brick building that's just a flat painted brick. So that's why we we feel we can put a mural there. You don't want to put a mural on a raw brick building, but one that's already painted is suitable in terms of historic preservation of damaging the brick. I'm curious about the anti-graffiti coating that you mentioned, yep. um, which we'll use on these murals, I guess, but also on others. We've done all of the ground accessible murals are already coated. So the, the red brick building is up a floor. We won't need to do that. But the back of um, bent nails, I think we would do graffiti coating on that too. Yes. And it, what, what does it do? It, it's a clear doesn't coat. allow the. Yeah, just the if you if someone painted it, it would wipe right off. It yeah, it's a standard nationally used product. Bob Hannum, who's an art restorer, sourced that and it's top quality. Like the mural on Shaw's is completely coated. So if someone were to spray it, we just go and clean it off. These are big investments, and we don't want to see them damaged. Sure. Yeah, well, that's a concern that we had. Yep. Is there a motion to approve this? I, I just had a question. Sure, Actually, sure, this sure. is more because someone in the public is going to ask this question. So I figured we must well ask and answer. These are all go through design review and all. Because the structures are painted already, they don't actually have okay. to go through design review. Right. Yep. They're, they fall into the right. temporary. In the first place, right? Or is that not the issue? Just figured I'd ask because yeah, someone yeah. else yep. is going to ask. Yep. Yep. And by the same token, doesn't have to go through the SHPO? Through what? SHPO. Data uh, Star, Data Star Preservation, Preservation Officer. I'm I'm not aware of that, um, but the, I know uh, Meredith is aware of the structures and the, and the project. She didn't mention anything okay. about that. All right. The uh, the portrait on the left, the mural on the left. Is there a building that has a corner like that? That's an actual superimposition on a photograph. Really? So the the red brick building that has the cafe in front and the um, and the uh, North Branch Cafe has that forty five degree corner on the uh, I guess that'd be the northwest corner. On the back side. Yeah. Yep. Probably done so that vehicles could get into that parking lot. Ha have a look. It's a really, I hadn't noticed it either. But when it was presented, we all said, yeah, oh. I know the, on, the, on the State Street side, it's it's a square. It's yeah, no, corner. it's that back corner. And I think it's it's a fabulous place because it's, as I said, it's already painted. So it's really easy to undo it if you, you know, if you wanted to, but it doesn't damage brick to go up there. And that's why the historic people probably have no say because it's already painted. I, I I must say the first time I saw these, I said, wow, you know, these are really big. Yep. Right in the middle of downtown. Um they're not actually right in the middle of downtown. I mean they're sort of mm -hmm. uh, around the corner. I mean if they were in the middle of downtown, I would have some misgivings about something that large. I, I don't know. It just it's very subjective, I guess. But um Given where you're, where they where they are going to be placed, um, it kind of mitigates that. I think. Yeah. Yep. I mean, they're they're magnificent. Uh, they're yeah, awesome. we've been doing work on on um, Tyvek on frames, like on oh, the bridge wow. over here and up on the side of um, Rabble Rouser, 
and those can come down. And we've been trying to do really inexpensive big murals. The, I think the best wall in the city is the side of the drawing board. And we have looked at proposals, but we haven't seen anything that was universal and dynamic enough that we thought we wanted sort of our most important wall painted. And I think when these were proposed, we all thought they were really strong, really beautiful pieces and in on walls that suited it without, mm -hmm. you know, them being, you know, if you go to Chicago, there's there's hundreds of murals. Chicago got famous for doing these. Montreal's famous for them, but they tend to be more wild style. And so these as portraits, I think, are a little bit more staid and yet really dynamic and beautiful. And that's why our commission was excited about these. And we haven't had problems with graffiti on the Shaw, for example, on the Long Shaw's you know, No, well, somebody did a little bit, and yeah. that's what prompted us. The artist didn't want us to do anything, oh. but we haven't had a real problem. There's been a couple instances, and that's why we decided this summer that all of the work should just be graffiti proofed and we weren't going to leave it sort of for with hope rather we were just going to take care of it because we when they do get graffitied we go and paint over them and that's kind of a waste of time yeah anything else is there a motion to approve this request lauren um i move we approve the Funding requested by the Public Arts Commission for the three identified projects for a total of $25,000. And is there a second? Any discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Any opposed? All right. Thank you for bringing Thank this you. in. Thank I you for continuing it. to work on this with uh, very, very little money. Yeah. Thank you much. <laughs> Still fun. Yeah. Still next, matters. <clears throat> next up, we have item number 16, appoint the city voting representative for the League of Cities and Town annual me meeting. Um, so the Vermont League of Cities and Towns is our collective representative uh, in the legislature, amongst many other things, our insurance provider, our trainer. But specifically for this issue, they, uh, they adopt a, a municipal policy through a a series of committees for different topics. We've had several staff representatives on many of the committees. Um, we've got, I'm, I'm the president of the league board right now, so we have some influence in, in how these come out. Um, but they have an annual election uh, where people actually debate and vote on the policy and we're only allowed one voting rep per town. It's next Tuesday. I think it's gonna be all virtual, except for the board members will be present. Um, so, I will be present and could serve as the town's rep, but typically it's nice if there's an elected official who could do it. Now, in years past, they've also traveled meeting. And I would say you're all welcome to attend. I mean, if you'd like, I can sign you up and you can go to the Wednesday training sessions that is available to any elected officials as well as appointed officials. So, and the time for that vote is, uh, is three o'clock or something, it's I think. It's in the cover sheet. Yeah. Okay. Three, three, yeah. Yeah. So, in Usually goes for an hour. It depends on how, how controversial the topics are. So if there's anyone who wants to do it, I uh, I have a hearing court that starts at two fifty five. So otherwise, I would be I might might or might not be free. But so I would be happy to do it. But I think I'm not probably not available. Uh, and we can uh, we can designate bill or if uh, any other member of the council wants to do it. It doesn't have to you be can... In fact, it's better if it's one, of you. but if you can, I, I will be there. So I'm your backstop, but, mm -hmm. but you, the, the board does Jerry. have to vote to appoint someone because otherwise they can't vote. I would love to do it and I cannot do it. So we'll be an independent chair. At the you just, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is a, a good excuse to, Get out of that, but <laughs> <laughs> Sal, are you checking your calendar? Yeah. Check. So it's this, it's like next week. Right. Mm -hmm. Tuesday. Wednesday. Uh, Tuesday, the first. By gumbo, I'm open. Do you want to do it? Um, sure, why not? All right. 
All those in favor of yeah. designated uh, Sal yeah. to do it? <laughs> <laughs> Indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? That could be awkward, but <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> all right, Sal, you're it. So we will send the um so we'll send your name in. There's a way that we have to register you as a vote, and I will make sure you get a copy of the full, if you don't already have the full proposal for municipal policy, yeah, so, right. so you can see it in advance. Should I have it? It may have gone out. It probably did at some point, but we'll make sure you get it. Right. And it's broken up into, I think there's five, like public safety, uh, fair, which is uh, finance and uh, has to do with finance and, and that sort of thing. And then uh, environment, housing, so there's so th there's committees for each of those, and then there's a list of things. So typically, what will happen is someone will move the the, the policy as presented, and then they'll ask if anybody wants to flag something for discussion, kind of like a consent agenda. Yeah. So, yeah. and then they'll vote the rest of it, you know, in full, and then just discuss the two or three hot topics that people pick out. So sometimes it goes really fast if there's no nothing gets pulled. Otherwise, sometimes like during Education funding years, Act 60, uh, we were there a long time. Because, you know, different towns had different opinions about it, right? Yeah, Winners exactly. and losers. So, um, you know, and that does happen. You do, occasionally something will come up that, you know, is even really a big deal for larger communities and maybe not so great for small or the other way around. But I'm not waiting there. Got it. And as for the town fair, I'm still trying to figure out, based on my court calendar, whether I'm able to be the... there. But uh, but well, there's a, I went yeah, last year. And... There's a day-long training and things you can go. And some uh, Jim, Jim Cantori is actually the from the Weather Channel is the keynote speaker to talk about weather events. Covering a weather event, yeah. What's that? What's his busy reporting on Earth? Well, that's it. I don't know. I think they've locked him down. Who knows? <laughs> Everybody will be standing up there at the front of the room, holding on to a sign. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, city Council reports. Adrian, Karen, Val. Uh, no, I just wanted to direct your attention to the um, statements by the Homelessness Task Force. I think everybody got a, got a copy. Um, you know, there there was quite a um, quite a discussion in the last two meetings about you know what's going on at Country Club about the policy and 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 the communication with HDF and the role of HDF and so I think the idea of having a um, a discussion a meeting with those folks to see uh, how we can use their them as a resource and uh, and see see if we can make some headway on on the issue. Thanks. Palin, Lauren. Just wanted to make sure it's on everyone's radar that the um, Montpelier Commission for Recovery and Resilience, the next forum um, is happening to discuss the Montpelier Action Plan for Local Emergencies, MAPLE. So there's a draft plan that the commission's been working really hard on with city staff and um, a consultant that's been hired. Uh, so. This is a great chance for um, input from the community. So it's got city components and also community components. So would um, love for as many people as possible to come and learn about it and weigh in. Uh, so that's happening on October 10th from 6.30 to 8.30 p.m. at the high school auditorium. Great. I don't think I knew. So so that's great. Thanks, Lauren. Um, Mayor's report, I do not have anything tonight. City clerk. Uh, this is, of course, the election body, the November election, where everybody gets a ballot sent to them. The ballots are all going out this week. So hopefully folks should start receiving them at the latest next Tuesday or so, but we're hoping for earlier than that. Um, that's That's all I got. Thanks. City manager's report. Um, I don't have a lot just to report that uh, the assistant city manager and I just returned today from four days in Pittsburgh, which we both highly recommend uh, at ITMA, International City Managers Association Conference. 
Uh, I think it was very, we had a lot of sessions on a lot of different things. The big issues, I think homelessness was everywhere, AI and its uses and concerns, uh, good and bad in, in the public sector was really a big source of conversation. Uh, we great speaker about generations uh, as we're kind of all represented here in this room. And uh, <laughs> so very, very good. And of course, good to connect with all old uh, compadres. Uh, I just want to seek one clarification because it's been said twice now at a council meeting and, and we did not have this as an action item. I don't recall, nor did I have in any of my notes or we have in the record, that the council actually voted to direct the housing committee and the housing task force, homelessness task force, to create a plan within 30 days. I believe the individual that has talked about it said, said we should do that, but I don't think the council did. But if I'm wrong, I want to be told that. I don't think you're wrong. This one, no, this. she went back and watched the whole video because I was like, did we vote on that? So I suggested it in conversation, but we just right. moved on to the next. Right. Okay. Topic. And and I'm not saying it's a bad idea, but I also yeah. wanted to make sure there was no directive given that had not mm -hmm. been met. And now we're going to meet with them. Look, I had the same thought. Thank you. So that's all I have. Oh, and in that actually reminded me, I went to a great sex session on handling people with dignity and uh, having higher quality conversations. I've got a great handout. I was going to put it on your desk, but I'll have it for the next meeting. Okay. And we were speculating at the break on when we would be adjourning, and it is 9.32, and we are adjourned. <laughs>